Welcome to Uptown Rumble. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is April 6th, 2024. I'm here for a very interesting uh, uh, kind of cross uh, oral history here. Um, and why don't, why don't you all go ahead and introduce yourself. Phil, uh, go ahead and start. So my name is Phil Bives. I'm the lead vocalist of Irate, The Judas Syndrome, and now Knights of the Black. And I'm originally from Bronx, New York. Happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. My name is Jay Vibes. I play left lead guitar in Knights of the Black, second generation Vibes here, and I'm also from the Bronx, New York. Gary Motley, uh, bass for Billy Club Sandwich and many other bands, which we've discussed before. Uh, born and raised in the Bronx, and looking forward to this little round table. Awesome. Thank you all. Uh, this should be a really fun yeah. and entertaining conversation. So, uh, Phil and Mutley, why don't you all start off? Let, let, let's hear your own version of events because a lot of times people have different memories about how they met each other. But, um, but Phil, why don't we start off with you? How'd you meet Mutley? I believe I met Mutley, or our first conversation was probably in the Pyramid Club. Uh, it was maybe Irate's third gig. And uh, Billy Club was also on there. That was Billy Club's second show. Right. That and, was in uh, the basement yeah. of the pyramid. Oh, okay. Yes, basement yeah, of the pyramid. Basement yeah, of the, the pyramid. Basement okay. of the pyramid, not the main room that we played many times later. Now, Motley still wasn't in the band yet. Not, he was for, in a, not for a couple of years. Not a couple more years after. That was 90... And had to be six. 96. 96. Yeah, 96. Um, and so, you know, all in the same room, everyone's dancing, having a good time, and conversations start happening. And um, I, I don't remember the first thing I said to you, but I, I think it was I, all. <laughs> I can tell you, I'm sure, I don't remember who introduced us. It was right. probably Martin or Glenn. But I can tell you, being the ball buster that I am, uh, you know, obviously I was there to see Billy Club. I raped was new to me. And I think you asked me if I watched the show, and I was like, oh, you guys play? And I was just fucking... <laughs> oh. Total dick from day one. <laughs> I was just like, I was like, oh, you guys play? And I didn't want... Oh, oh I didn't even know. <laughs> just because I'm a dick like that. But, but that, you know, that was an introduction to my uh, assholery. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it was 96... At the Pyramid Club in the basement, yeah. Yeah, we talked outside. I remember that. Now, I want to go back a little further. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I went to Billy Club's very first show. Oh, and was okay. Um, and that was at Wetlands in, in uh, the Lower Early, East Side. Earlier 96. Or the Lower West Side. What, what was that? It was way West Side. Yeah, Lower West Side. Like over by the, the whatchamacallit, the Holland Town. It was one of our favorite clubs, and they got fortunate enough to get on that bill because uh, Rod, the original play, a bass player for Billy Club. Guitar player. Guitar player. Yeah. Right? Forgot that Malone was originally the bass player. That's right. They forget that. Bit of history sometimes. It's hard, hard to keep track. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, uh, Rod had this low rider that he lent to Madball. Okay. For their video shoot of Pride. Yes. Oh, shit. Pride. Okay. Okay. Yes. The, 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 off this record. the one with the hydraulics that yep. you see in the Pride video. That's that his. Was, that was Rod. So that's Rod uh, from BCS. Okay. And so through that connection, they got on that bill. The bill was Madball, Agnostic Front, uh, Indecision. Uh, it was a tremendous first show for them. I kind of hate them for that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that. That was their first fucking show. Shit. Fuck you guys. Um, but yeah, that was my introduction. And I had already known Martin uh, and had the demo already. Because uh, he told me about the demo. I went to Bleaker Bob's, got the demo, was really into it. And I'm not sure if I knew beforehand they were playing. I, I probably did, but... They were their opening act for that show. And, uh, you know, great, great first show for them, and they had a great response. Uh, I remember Dancer for them getting down and dirty with them. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what introduced me to Glenn and Tony and Rob. I see, I see, um, I see. That show. I already knew Martin, and I met Martin uh, in the pit, uh, hating each other, wanting to fight each other. <laughs> Um, and you know, we kind of stepped to each other. Where was that? At yeah, Wetlands. Right. Wetlands right? Also, Wait, what show was that? Do you remember? So that was a Death Stop. 
Oh, oh yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, Fernando, uh, the lead guitarist and I, Ray and I, were at that show. You know, we were young and crazy and doing our thing. And he was doing his thing, and it was just, we just kept hitting each other. And as Latino men, you know, eventually, <laughs> you're going to catch feelings about these things. So, uh, you know, we stepped to each other, and, and, and I, I remember telling you this story before, but we stepped to each other and then just started laughing because we just realized in the moment right. that we're just being idiots. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that kind of forged our friendship. Now, I had seen Martin prior to that. At, a, at another show that uh, Barry and I had gone to. Right. Uh, that church in Tremont. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. Sure, sure, uh, sure. The Metal Madness. Show. Metal Madness, yep. Uh, I, but we didn't talk. Okay, okay. It was just like he was there, I was there, and all that stuff. Yeah. You had to break uh, the ice with fight first. Yeah, yeah. You got to <laughs> stop it up. <laughs> so that was my introduction to Martin. Start. It's true. Uh, and then, you know, I met these guys later on with that first show, and that's kind of when that started happening, and then, you know, we started playing shows together. Do you remember, what was the first show that Irate and Billy Club played together? It was probably that Pyramid show. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, that, that was only Billy Club's second show. Oh, okay, oh, okay. Yeah. So that, was a, that was a very We played show. many, okay, okay, okay. I mean, you guys played many times since then, including after I joined the band. But yeah. That was, yeah, that, that was, was the first, first show. That was your, uh, so you said, sure, you sure, said sure, that was sure, your sure. third show? That was, that was the third, third show. The second okay. show was... And when Will comes, we're going to talk about that, uh, where he built us as Iraq. At, uh, that's the uh, house party, backyard right? Backyard party. Backyard yeah. party. So okay. that was our second show, and then our third show was the. What was the first show? Uh, the first one was Castle Heights with really? the humanized. Okay. Oh. Back okay. in '96. That was September '96. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. And did you all? I, I forget. Were you all on the bill of the Blue Frog show that some of the. No, we were like not. That? that was a District 9 show. Okay, right. so that was before you. I think that was before that you. That was all before. That was before. Just form, before that's right. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. About yeah, a yeah. year or two before. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, Muttley, do you remember what were your impressions, if you even remember them at the time of your first time seeing Irate? I mean, obviously, to they, them, you said, I, I didn't mean, even know y'all played, but... They progressed. <laughs> yeah, I, I was... But I, I watched them. I thought they were good. But over time, they went way beyond those early days. Like, that was... You know, like, you could compare it to, like, Candiria, where, like, if you saw early Candiria, it was, it was cool. But they just progressed in, in, in an exponential way that was, like, way more than than what they had started. Yeah. So it was, it was totally, I can't even say it's the same thing because if you take that versus like later on after Burden in 1134, like light years ahead of what, what they were in the early days, but that's natural. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, what was the first show that Irate and Billy Club played together after you got in the band, Mutley? Do you remember that? Probably Castle Heights. Okay. Fun. Yeah. Because we we had well, I joined the band in two thousand one, and Castle Ice was only around until two thousand two. So in that time, we definitely played together at least once or twice, and then we played together after that. We played. I'm sure we played the Red Zone together, didn't we? Yeah, we played. We played the Red Zone together. We played all the boroughs, I think. <laughs> Uh, and at that point, you know, uh, in 2001, Irate was a well-oiled machine, and so was Billy Club. Yeah, yeah. You know, we were well-established, uh, and Castle Heights was already our home. You know, any in, in, any band that would come in there would, would tell you that that was our house. That's right. You know? Um, well, it was our house for multiple reasons, because yeah. at different points, Phil worked there, yeah. I worked there, Glenn worked there. Uh-huh. Uh, so Phil was a bouncer. Our house. Yeah, Phil yeah. was a bouncer there. Yeah. I was a bouncer there, and I also did sound sometimes. And then Glenn did sound on some nights also. So it really was our house because we we would play there, we would work there. After we were done working, we'd hang out there until like four in the morning, yeah. drinking for free. So like that was literally our home at least a couple of days a week. And when we were bouncing. Uh, it was easier because they listened to us. Sure. Versus was, like some yeah. other guy bouncing there and he'd had a, <clears throat> a lot of trouble that night or uh -huh, whatever. You know? uh -huh. That was the if key. If things went awry. 
Yeah, because everybody knew everybody. Yeah. So, and I think that was by design from Kevin, the promoter. Oh, there, for sure. To keep everyone in line, you yes. know, put your own people in there, and then everybody will be cool. Because yeah. you have the opposite, like if you ever go to like one of these dance type clubs, and the limelight always had this problem. Yeah. Uh, you got these bouncers that are just not connected with the scene and like don't know what goes on. They don't know what like hardcore dancing is and stuff like that. Uh -huh. So like yeah, they don't understand. They just start grabbing people up immediately and it turns into a disaster. And that's when people don't like going to those places. That's right. The castle was the opposite, and that's why like some of us ended up working security for other places also because it's like you know the people, you know the environment. You don't have to. They don't have to worry about something getting lost in the translation. Yeah. So they wouldn't have problems and people would be happy to go to a show there because we always used to grumble about some of these shows, like the limelight and shit, like the oh, security assholes. And, like, and that was always that way. God, like, I hated the limelight. That's why, like, back in the day, you had the riot at the Palladium when Agnostic Front played because security <laughs> uh -huh. were just assholes. And They're a bunch of juice heads, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these big juiced up dudes yeah. and they just don't know or care about our culture so it just turns into like you know a, a conflict so i remember real quickly nando got into a situation at the line right and he got thrown out by some juice heads mm -hmm. okay. so then i waited a couple of minutes and then i fought the kid that messed with nando and then I got fucking thrown out <laughs> but with me they had extra prejudice they fucking Took my face and hit the doors on the way oh, out. I was yeah. assholes. I got, I got so thrown out of there once. And then, and then I, I don't know how it happened, but we got back. Yeah. Yeah. I forget what show it was. And somebody took a swing at somebody, and it wasn't even me. Or I forget who was with me. I forget. It. I don't think it was my brother. I forget who. But like the two of us got thrown out. And then. Somehow they let us back in. You can't be in this kind of music was. without some sort of altercation. Yep. It's just the, the lay of the land. Like, you can't be in the Bronx, grow up in the Bronx without ever thumping it with somebody. <laughs> right. But then school or whatever. But, you but know, apparently, sometimes that's how you become friends, right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Some of my greatest relationships are forged in that <laughs> No question about it. So, since you all have just been talking a little bit about Castle Heights. Um, let's let's do like a little bit of a big picture thing, and then we'll we'll take it down. Yeah. Um, why don't uh, each of you uh, and and Jay, if you want to weigh in the, in, the, in on this too, even though you you didn't go to Castle Heights, but why don't you all uh, kind of share what you think Castle Heights contributed to the scene at the time? What was so important about Castle Heights? Castle Heights, uh, especially when clubs in the city were closing, was a home for for bands to play, aggressive bands, you know, yeah. death metal, hardcore, thrashers, they all play Castle Heights. And not just our bands, but you had, we had everybody come, E-Town, uh, Hatebreed, Candiria, they all came to there. Why could they were friends with us? Mastodon, Mastodon. Mastodon. Early days. Yeah. Wow. Critopsy, like all uh -huh. these major acts came through that little tiny room. Yeah. Because they wanted to play there. Crowbar played there. Crowbar, better. like you can name so many bands that have gone through there that no one knows about because yeah. Castle isn't talked about like it should be. Yeah. Um, but for Irate personally, it was our launching pad. It if it wasn't for Castle, I don't think I'd be sitting here right now. Yeah. You know, there, there's no question in my mind that because of Castle Heights giving us the opportunities they gave us to showcase us in front of people, like, uh, you know, every couple of months, those those beginning years, and eventually earning the right to headline the, the, the spot and packing it out on our own name. It all happened because of great people there that believed in our band, Kevin Scandato, John the Dorman, Uncle Louie, Frank, all those guys, they believed in Irate, and they wanted us to thrive, and they gave us that space to do that, and we took the ball and we ran it. Yeah. And then our boys did the same thing, you know? Billy Club, everybody gets hurt, so what I mean? We all did the same thing together, and you couldn't book us together after a while. Yeah. It was, you just oh, asked just, it was too much. Just asking for trouble. Yeah. It was too much. Yeah. So they stopped that, and, they, and we would all just headline our shows. But of course, we would all go hang out. For sure. <clears throat> so it was the same thing. 
Uh, but it was a launching pad. It, it's the reason I'm sitting here today, and I'm so grateful for for them and for what they did for Iran and and W. For for me, I, I can put it in more of a historical perspective. Where over the years, sometimes you'll have that one spot that's central for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, not long after I started going to shows, the Bond Street Cafe was the spot. Sure. Uh, and I used to work around the corner, so I was always there. Like, I'd go there on lunch breaks, and I'd go back after I was off work, stuff like that. Uh, but the thing with the Bond Street Cafe is that we we didn't have a bond with, like, the owners. Yeah. The bartenders, the staff. Like, it was always, I don't want to say it was an adversarial relationship, like what we were talking about with, like, the limelight or something. But it wasn't, there wasn't a mix in it. Um, Castle Heights was unique in the sense that not only was it kind of home for a lot of us, but we also had a bond not just with Kevin, who booked the shows, and John the doorman, who was working the door, but even Frank, the owner, Uncle Louie, uh, the other bartenders and the other staff that were there, we were tight with all of them, and that wasn't even because we worked there. It was more the other way around, because we knew everybody... Kevin asked us to work there, and and it was seamless. But we, it was home because they treated us like family. Yeah. Most other clubs, it's like we're it's just business. they're just there uh-huh. for business. I don't give a shit about no. You. You're a customer yeah. with with Frank, and with Kevin and John, and the rest of the staff. It was always we were always tight. Uh, we hung out there plenty of time. We would go there, of course. Even when we weren't playing yeah. or working, yeah, um, just have a you know, we we go and support each other, but also sometimes we just stop by there, like you know, some smaller bands are playing. We're just going to hang out, see some new bands, and just hang with our people because we we were friends with the whole staff, and it was just it was one of our places to hang out. It was home for us because of that. So it was a different type of relationship. And honestly, like I said, that's rare because other places over the years, we've had other places that were kind of central. Like, we went to a lot of shows at Wetlands, but we weren't friends with all the staff at the Wetlands. Uh, other places, like we were friends with some of the staff, but it wasn't the same yeah. kind of, whether it was CBGBs, uh, Coney Island High, Coney Island High the Red Zone, like all these different places. We That relationship that we had was unique because... <laughs> All the people that went there, for the most part, were friendly with each other. Uh, all the bands were friendly with each other because it was a whole scene, and then the staff also. So, it was, so it was it was a rare environment where all of those things clicked a certain way. And honestly, I don't know if we, I don't know if we've really ever had that since. No, because we had places where we would do shows like the Pyramid was home for a while, but with the staff, it wasn't that kind of relationship at all. Um, you know, we, there's a few places where we're friendly with people, yeah. but it wasn't the same type of family relationship like we had with with Frank and John and Kevin in Castle. Island. Like those are lifelong friends. Yeah, and I just yeah. feel like um, just the whole movement in general. You know, it was so iconic, and it, you know, really had to do with that place from all the stories that I've heard. Um, because you know, it allowed to have these guys at home. To sort of you know master their craft in an environment in which they're comfortable and familiar. That's right. You know they go there. They know they're going to sound good. They know people are going to show up. They know they're going to be in their fucking element. You know and bring the pain and really focus on on showcasing who they are, their identity in relation to their sound, uh, and 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 be that pinnacle for the next generation. But also, as these guys said, just like the bond between people, like. John the doorman texts me every few months and we have a conversation like, and wow. um, I just bought comic books off him and stuff like that. And I wasn't even there, you know, <clears> like <throat> I'm the next generation, but that the relationships still hold true. Um, all those guys that were together in Castle, I, you know, I've been the universal nephew my whole life. You know what I'm <laughs> saying? Much. I'm that role, like, that's true. That, that's that, such that. a... Great depiction of yeah. yeah. the universe. It, it, it just it speaks volumes of to what that place enabled for these guys to experience uh, and live a life. Because you know, most people they go to work, they go home, they may do whatever on the weekend, but you know, these guys were living. You know, That's right. Um, and they were doing it. They were doing it there first and foremost. So you know, may it rest in peace. And it's crazy because bigger bands than we were 
that played that room didn't want to didn't want to go over us. Uh huh. Yeah, because they knew they were smart enough. They were enough. smart enough not to, that, that we would take their lunch money. Yep. Yeah, they were smart enough, and they yeah. knew that that we, you know, not not to put us up certain. No. But we kind of ran that room. We yeah, knew, sure. They knew that no matter what, they weren't going to top irate. They weren't going to top Billy Club. They weren't going to top BGH or Sworn Enemy because those. You know, and, and this all ties in together because that's kind of where the five fingers of death came from. It was from that whole scene because we talked about the relationships with the staff and stuff like that. But our bands in general, because there were a lot of bands that played there and, and we were all tight to a point And most of us to this day, you know, close 22 years ago. We're still friends on a personal level with so many people from all of these bands. But, <clears throat> and we say the five fingers of death, and one is kind of out of the mix. Four fingers, of death. <laughs> it's really the four fingers of death, which <laughs> Jamie Hayfrey. Um, but, uh, but it's telling because last week, like I told you before, I had my first performance in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Who was there? Billy Club. A sworn enemy, EGH, uh -huh. been off to me. Still, 30 years in. That's crazy. Showing up for me in my time of need. Not my time of need, but when I need, like, to pick me up. Yeah, when sure, I need sure, that sure, support, sure. Right. like, because I'm nervous as all fuck to get on the stage again. <clears throat> even though this second nature to me, but I just haven't, when you haven't done something like so hard, you know, you, you kind of, you, you get that nervous little, about it. That little push. Push. But he was there. Uh, you know, in my ear, Rob was there in my ear, Sal was in there, you know, and Martin. They got me through it. Wow. And, and that's because of fucking Castle Fights. Wow. Yeah, and also the different subgenres, too. Like, you know, you can have dehumanized play with yeah. Billy Club uh -huh. or District 9, and, you know, like different sounding bands where so many tour packages are just the same sound. Like, you'll go right. hear Blast Meets for six hours. That's right. Or breakdowns for six hours. Like, you know, it's good to mix it up. That's yeah, right. You, you can mix it up and still still do well. Yeah. We used to love playing with Dehumanized, man. That was, those were some great See, but you could do irate with Dehumanized, or you could do irate with, like, No Redeeming. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Either, still, either way, that's right. It's still all going to flow, and it's still going to be a lot of the same people. And everybody's going to get along <clears throat> and love each other yep. and all that stuff. But back to the Five Fingers of Death thing, those relationships were formed early on. Yeah. You know, we talked about the relationship with, like, Billy Club and Irene, which which is a tight relationship on its own, but you know, I first met the Sworn Enemy guys in like '98, I think, maybe a little earlier. Um, we we're called Mindset then. Yeah, they were still Mindset at that point. Um, EGH, I knew from the jump pretty much, wow. because I was friends with with the Benettos family, because Nick B was in Cold Front. Uh, you know, Chris B started EGH. Their sister used to work with me at Tower Records. That's crazy. So I was wow. friends with that whole family. Um, and then we formed our relationships over time. And we're still tight now. And we even were lucky enough to take that to other parts of the world. Yeah. When we went to Puerto Rico in 04. It was Sworn Enemy, EGH, Irene, Bill Cook. The family trip. Yeah, it was a family trip. Is what it was. It's the only time though that we all four were together yes. in another ground. Ah, um, the I only see. time. Only so time. So I huh? really truly cherish that. Honestly, I don't know if all four of us ever played together in the states. We played in twos or threes, but yeah, I don't, like all but not all I don't think it was ever Never all four. four of us. Wow. So that was the trip, and that's why it means so much, especially since. Paulie is not here with us yeah. anymore, and Greg is not around anymore. Yep. Um, we cherish those memories because we miss those guys so much, uh, and life kind of sucks without them. But we can we can think fondly to that time, and we even have video, a lot of video from oh, that yeah. trip, a lot Richard's of hijinks, video. a lot I of pranks. Know. There's a lot that a went lot on of that trip. Yeah, <laughs> things that we'll never see the light. Yes, a lot <laughs> of classified. Yeah, classic things. stuff. But, <laughs> But we, again, that's the relationship. It wasn't, it, 
with us. It wasn't a business relationship. We're all friends. We still, to this day, all these years later, we're still hanging out together. We're still talking. Like, you know, these, these are friendships that have gone way beyond, like, the music and beyond, like, whatever place we used to hang out at. Like, all these years later, we're still in touch. We're still doing stuff. Half a Billy Club, Gary and Martin, uh, have lived in my mother's house at different points. Uh, and when they were in between apartments or whatnot, that's how deep this goes. Right. Now, my mother loves them. Wow. Yeah. You know, like, it, it's weird. Yeah. Like, my mother has housed or, uh, you know, hosted half of the greatest bands in New York. <laughs> and she doesn't realize that, but, like, <laughs> you know, if you say that to the average hardcore guy, they're like, oh, shit. Like, yeah. you know, she, she's lucky and all that stuff. Uh, but to her, it's just these dudes that I love, and she loves them because I love them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the common theme in my life, too. Yeah, Growing and up, so he grew met, up in he was guys, guys all the time. People used to just pull up to the house <clears throat> wow. all the time. He'd be like, hey, this is this from that, and such and such. And, and I'd be like, cool, run around, play with my toys, looking for you. <laughs> Not realizing that, you know, realizing he's an adult, of course. Yeah, sure, sure. In the presence of all this greatness, you know, and I'm just, I don't even realize the the weight of the situation. Um, so, yeah. Um, I know that that's probably how I, I met Gary and Chris was, you know, one time they came to the house. I can't oh, remember sure. how old I was, but I know that that um, I always I always enjoyed hanging out with the Billy Club dudes because it was always a fun time. Yeah. Um, regardless of whoever came to the house at any point, when BCS was in the house, I was happy. Um, yeah. And they always showed me the love. Everybody always showed me love. They, in particular, always made me feel like I was part of the group being a kid. Because I'll be honest with you, I was always around adults. I was never really around other kids. Yeah, sure. You know? so, I was I a mean, kid yeah. myself when I had him. Yeah. And yeah. I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he grew up in it. I even had some tall Billy Club don't aren't really adults anyway. So. <laughs> True. Jay, what, what year were you born? Was it 96? I was born in 96. Um, wow, yeah, yeah. So My earliest memories, year. my earliest memories actually even involve all these guys. Oh, really? Night, just to make sure I remember things correctly. I was talking about some of the memories that I have that are just still shots of me being, I guess, so young that, you know, I'm just stationary as a child. But I, I remember images of of like the original irate group hanging out in the 94 um in the 194 bainbridge mm -hmm. uh, apartment in the attic Did you take a picture wow you know, yeah like i remember <laughs> being stationed there i remember like the brown door with the gate that led to the roof you guys used to hang out on yeah. smoke and drink and all that stuff um there's a picture of him holding me and the and, burden of a crumbling society. Yeah, and it's Jay Ray, Nick yeah. Ray, UV Ray, he's not in the red room, and we recreate that Yeah, image 20 years later. At Glenn's house. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, which, uh, you know, coincidentally is a, a great place to see a lot of that unaired uh, BCS Migrate footage. But, uh, uh, um, he's the keeper of uh, He is the keeper. That, right? Oh, for sure. Indeed he is. But, Glenn could ruin us all at some point, I <laughs> 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 But, uh, you know, just just, just uh, many years of, of real love and, and always feeling like I was a part of something. As an adult, I'm able to appreciate and look back fondly and realize that I didn't have a uh, conventional life for a regular kid, man. Like, for sure. Um, and, and, and certain things would come into play that would uh, still be irregular. Like, for example, I went to school down the hill from here. To 368, and when I went there, who was the security guard? Barry, but Barry Ruiz. Oh, so, you know, I went to school with Uncle Barry having my back. You know, wow. and the kids wanted to fuck with me. They had to answer the That's crazy. And me, so it was like double trouble. Uh, but also with those guys, like Ruben Ruiz, Barry's son, was like my first friend ever. Ah, like okay, I see. Before I went to school, and I used to hang out at like Barry's house with my moms and like play Smash Brothers on Nintendo 64 with him or like Yu-Gi-Oh with him and Barry. Yeah, if you yeah. didn't know that, Barry's a big Yu-Gi-Oh guy. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was a play, he play with some Yu-Gi-Oh for damn sure. Um, and, and, and you know, just always being in awe at his Star Wars collection uh -huh. and shit mm. like that. Um, I was talking with my mom last night actually 
about a barbecue we went to at his place. I think he was living somewhere on Boston Road at the time. Okay, okay. But um, he had like a basement grilling and he had like two pools and shit like that. And it's like all these, it's family, but then hardcore people and kids. It's and, all like, intermixed, it, right? It's such a weird mix up because like the fans, they go to hardcore shows and they see one side of this, but yeah. then like we go in the background and we're like family. Yeah. Or like, oh, this is my cousin, this is like my mom, this is, you know, it's just such a different dynamic. Um, and it's sometimes it's even hard to put into words, because to me, to him, to these guys, it's all like regular shit. You know? Yeah, yeah, like, for sure. It's to other life. people, the weight of it is like, oh my God, you know, you guys, you're, you're all this and that, but you know, at the end of the day, I guess we're all just like one big family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, behind behind the Castle Heights era, if you want to call it that, of of the scene there's all of all of this like you know deep family ties and people going into each other's, other's house and i feel like that's oh, one yeah. of the things that you know never gets spoken about whenever people talk about it what and and on those lines like i think it, it ties in nicely what are some of the like common i guess mischaracterizations or misperceptions of of this era of the scene and um uh and you know, how would you like to address those misperceptions? I mean, the castle fights thing was always castle a fights. problem because it's like people are like, oh, it's so violent over there. And like, uh, I remember sometime, one time, something popped off at CBGs. There was a big fight at CBGs, and somebody said, This is a castle fights, like one of the staff. And it was like, Really? Come on. But that's the kind of reputation that the place would have because. Around that time, uh, what you see now is like common with hardcore dancing, all the spin kicking, all the shit that I can't do because I'm too fat to do it. <laughs> um, the spin kicking and cartwheels and all that crazy Crack shit. Uh -huh. That stuff kind of spawned out of the Castle Heights scene. Like, I won't say it came exclusively from there because sure. I'm sure it. it I'm sure it evolved in other places, but but I've always had a lot of people talk about the guerrilla warfare DVD. That like that was the blueprint. Like and, and I'm talking people like not even in America. I'm talking yeah. about like I've had Europeans say this to me, sure, I've had sure. Japanese people say this to me, people from all over the world that they saw that and they were like, Oh my god, uh -huh. I, I need to try that because now if you go right. if you go to Puerto Rico, if you go to Japan, if you go to a lot of places in Europe, you'll see they're that doing the same thing. They're doing yep. the spin kicking stuff. They're doing the cartwheels. They're yeah. doing they're doing all that wild <clears throat> shit. And and personally, for me, I never really saw that stuff. Like you had plenty of hard dancing, but you could see the difference if you watch like Bond Street '94 videos. Yep. And you see me and Martin just bashing people. Versus like Castle Heights in like '99, you know, cartwheeling into cartwheeling ten, <laughs> right, and doing yeah. all kinds of crazy <laughs> high flyer shit. Yeah. Um, solid gold dancers in fucking Castle Heights, baby. That Somewhere between the solid gold dancers and like WCW crew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that affected my generation too because like growing up into that. Before I started dancing, I started dancing when I was 14. Wow. So okay, I, okay. I hit the bricks early. You did. That was because. They had like, you know, I had him as an influence and when I was a kid, I was single digits when he, you know, introduced what the concept of the pit was to me. Yeah. And he was like, you're either in it or you ain't. So like, maybe I had my own misconceptions as a kid. So when I first got into it, you know, I wanted to imitate all the things that I had seen in the Guerrilla Warfare video or like in the Gangland episode uh -huh. of the Hardcore Crews and shit like that. And... Um, you know, whether it was to the Judas Syndrome or to Billy Club or to whomever at the time, like, I, you know, I was a 14-year-old fucking maniac. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I was doing a lot of horrible things to people. Uh, and, Stressing and, me and, out because yeah, I'm like, this guy's going to get me fine. I got to definitely. fight now. And, you know, that definitely came later in my <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I was always blessed. We still got to keep an eye on I was always guys. blessed in the sense that I could pull that card at the end of the day when people kind of know who I am. Like, yeah, sure. Let it rock. But I've also met plenty of people by doing that. Get into it with somebody you know, have words after, but then ultimately just be like, ah, fuck it. I'm going to see you again next week anyway. Um, you know. Oh, it looks like it worked for your dad more. Yeah. I've actually, yeah. I've torn my UCL oh, to Billy Club. Oh, yeah. At Alphys. <laughs> at 
Alfie's. Pool table. I should have made them pay the fucking bill. Alfie's. Pool table in the middle of the week. And then I kept dancing, of course, you know, because I'm all hopped up on a German. Um... Yeah, yeah. This many, is bigger than ours. Many faces have been destroyed on my behalf to build a <laughs> So much so that like Martin used to shout me out on certain songs and be like, "Yo, go fuck the shit up, blah blah blah." Uh, but I wouldn't have done it if I would have never, you know, seen any of that Castle Heights footage that these guys had. Right, that was kind of the blueprint. So like, Castle Heights got the reputation for that. But meanwhile, as we were talking about before, when when at different times you. He and I were both bouncers there. You, you didn't have a lot of fights because most people knew each other. And if there were times that two people started to get into something that didn't know each other, we would usually know at least one of the two parties involved. Yeah. The biggest problem you had at Castle Heights really was just the random drunk people walking in off Northern Wall oh, Street. Because I, I could tell that didn't is. go too well sometimes. I bet, yes. Cats and I didn't just do hardcore shows. Yeah. <laughs> I used to work Thursday night. They would have Spanish rock nights. Uh -huh. And sometimes I would be doing sound or, or ba and bouncing because it really wasn't a big crowd. And I probably had more trouble those nights than I had at hardcore shows because there were at least a couple of times where I had drunk dudes that were like just being stupid or like trying to push up on women or something. And I had to throw them the fuck out. Yeah, yeah. So that was much more of a headache than we had in almost any hardcore. That brings me to the Nando Red Rum stuff. Oh. Now, you got to interview Nando here. Yeah. He's the nicest man on earth. Yeah, right? yeah, he okay? seems like it, yeah. I, there's no one nice. Yeah. All of us universally agree Absolutely. that Nando is yes. that level of nice. However, oh. if you push that button, you're not going to like what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So one time, a random person walks out uh, on the street, gets drunk there, uh, something, starts doing something to a young lady, and Nando says, hey, don't do that. The guy took it upon himself to slap Nando's face. Oh. <laughs> it took 12 people to try to, re to, try to restrain Nando. Okay, and he was just throwing all of us everywhere to get his guy. Those are the kinds of shits that, that happened there that were random. That, right. that, but I'll never forget that night because I never see Nando lose his cool. Yeah, yeah. And when you do, you, you better be scared. Yeah. Because a arts he's a martial artist, he can kill you. Yeah. He, he's a lethal yeah. weapon. But like most martial artists, he is a very peaceful inner man. You know, like he, he ain't about it. He yeah. is, Mr. But Mr. he's ready for it <laughs> if it ever comes. You know, so that was that was a night, man. That I couldn't believe what I saw. But when you have a weapon, yeah, you have to know how to use that weapon yep. and know when to restrain yourself yeah. and not use that weapon. That goes whether you're a martial artist or a gun owner or whatever. Um, and that, but that's the kind of stuff. Like those were more of a headache at Castle yes. Heights. Those were the things. And and truth be told, it was just kind of because we had the same problems when we used. You know, when the pyramid was home for us, uh -huh. there were a couple of times where we had drunk dudes come in and and, and have to get handled. Yeah. Um, that's your standard. If you're working, because I bounced in plenty of places that weren't necessarily music venues, just regular bars, it comes to the territory. Yep. You're a drunk asshole, you got to throw them out. We had to deal with that at Castle Heights, too. The hardcore shows, yeah, they were violent. But, but everybody knew each other. Too. Right, that was the thing. You, yeah. you might, like I said, if you had two parties that got into a scuffle, we would always know at least one of them and cut it quick. So the the amount of actual fights that you had at Castle Heights was minimal. So sure. It, so this whole Castle Fights thing is just a myth. It's all a bunch of nonsense because you really didn't have any fights because. As we said, that was home for a lot of us. We were all family. We knew we were friends with almost all the bands that were playing there, the young bands, the newer bands, the older bands, everything. Uh, most of the crowd that was there, we were friends with everybody. They were friends with each other. So it wasn't... And in the end, nobody really wanted to disrespect since we had that relationship That's right. with the owner, with the staff. Nobody really wanted to disrespect that either. 
Mm-hmm. So, like, even if you want to go and stuff with somebody, it's like, well, I'm not going to do that to Frank. No, go down the block. I'm not going to do that to Kevin. I'm not going to do that to, to John. And 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 they would say they wouldn't want to do that to us because we were the ones that would have to step into it. So that was that was a big misconception with Castleheads. Did yeah. fights happen? Absolutely. Sure. Sure they did. Happen everywhere. You can't have aggressive music and people hitting each other and yeah. not have that happen. Yeah. But it was greatly exaggerated, and you know we policed ourselves. Yeah. 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 But you would think that. You know, people were breaking bottles over each other's heads with the way they talk. Yeah, I know, but I know. It wasn't not at all the case. People yeah. make it like a TCW, <laughs> and it was to a degree but on the dancing <laughs> side, not the fighting side. Yeah, right, sure, you know? right, sure. So that, that's the biggest misconception, and that's, uh, and I guess it also got a reputation because people thought of it as like an insular scene, and they thought that, yeah, that. You know, people that went to Castle Heights just went to Castle Heights, and that definitely was not true at all because our bands traveled all, all over, over the place. place, and a lot of the people that followed us would go wherever we went. Now, the one Castle story I enjoy telling is Irate opened up for DSI in 1999 at, at Coney Island High. Uh, it was completely sold out, packed to the grills. We brought all of Castle Heights to that show. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> now you mix Castle Heights with long hair death metal guys. <laughs> By the third song, the sound man was begging for us to get off. <laughs> <laughs> Yelling into the mic, get the fuck off. I, we can't have this here. Blah, blah, blah. And we ignored him. Yeah. Good. And we kept going. And we played uh, Metallica's Damage Incorporated to end it. So it was already six, seven fight deep. Then we play that song, forget about it. Blood, ambulance, like all the shit there. Glenn Deicide comes up to me, and uh, I think it was Nick or Nando, and he goes, you know, we're Deicide, and we see a lot of crazy shit. <laughs> but this is the most insane shit I've ever fucking seen in my life. You guys are fucking animals, and I love you guys. And we got to hang out with fucking Glenn. That's badass. Smoke wow. the, smoked the blow with him, drank Jägermeister. <laughs> they let all our people hang out in the bar because the security was being a pain in the ass about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. He was like, no, their people are good. What I saw today, <laughs> fucking legendary. Wow. Let them hang. And yeah, that's my favorite Castle Heights. Game. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And there were a few times like that because I remember you guys playing with Nuclear Assault at oh, CBG yeah. one time. Oh, okay. And yeah, the place that's right, that's right. was yes. filled with Castle Heights people. Yeah. And, and it was crazy. We went and road trip with our Castle Heights. Right. <laughs> Well, but that's what I was saying, that, like, we would go and we would play different places, and because we were friends with, like, that was a giant click, because we were friends with the people that would come to see us, because, you know, you, you don't have this in some other kinds of music, where, like, like it, it, we're just regular dudes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, we're not doing meet and greets, we're not doing all this other shit, like, after we play, we're probably at the bar hanging out. Yeah, sure. Um... So, because of that, we became friends with a lot of the people that would come to see us. So, when we would go to different places, and it still goes to this day, because look at how many people were like that at the Fury 5 show. Uh, plenty of people that are not musicians at all, yeah. that just like the music, so they come out. And, and they still come out 20-something years later. So, we go and, and we play, and those people will come with us. And that includes the kickboxers. <laughs> so, Jamie Hatebreed was pissed at Irate for a little bit. Oh, really? <laughs> because he booked us in Bridgeport. He used to have the spot. It was like a skate park. Okay. And, you know, we exchanged shows back then. You know, yeah. I got them to come here to the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted us to go over there, so we went over there. And we brought, of course, the solid gold dancers, <laughs> specifically Lorenzo, <laughs> oh, uh, who was, Lorenzo was, was drinking at the time. Oh, so sure he was. beats up like three, four people. Like <laughs> our crowd just beats the shit out of the Connecticut crowd. And he and Jamie got mad about that, and I get it. But coincidentally, he ends up signing Lorenzo sworn in me a year later. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, but, but no, Jamie's great, and and it's all good. But like, yeah, I mean. That's funny. We, we couldn't bring these people anywhere. They would have <laughs> That's funny. History would repeat 
repeat itself because a few years ago he brought me to see Hatebreed in Florida. Yeah. And Hatebreed stopped the set in the middle of it because I got into a big fight with this big area. Thank God Jimmy oh, didn't know it was you. <laughs> he had like this, this eagle tattoo and shit and he was pushing the Hatebreed and I was bringing the New York heat over there so I think I like spin kicked him in the chest. <laughs> and, and he hits me and so we start going and then like um, my boys out there Mike and CeeLo shout out to you guys. Uh, they like get in the middle of the, and then Jamie Hatebreed Stops the fucking song and he's like, love each other and all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on stage watching, right? He's probably gonna curse somebody yeah. out and then he saw it was you. He was like, check it out. Shit. No, I, I don't think he saw it was him. No, okay. I had introduced them earlier. Yeah. And uh, I'm on stage with Avery because he, Jamie said, yo, come up on stage. Right, right, right. So I'm watching and I see this fight and I go, well, I hope that's not my fucking child. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope that that's not fucking him. And then after the set, like, you're all dead. I got to, oh, you fucking ass. <laughs> <laughs> In the Florida heat, too. Yeah, oh, no like, joke. It, it was really different. At the end of that day, like, I hardcore dance all day at that shit, man. Let me tell you something. You think, we have it, you think we have it bad here with these hot ass clubs? Uh -huh. They're doing it like outdoors at these big fuck that man. with never humidity again. and all that shit. Over hundred yeah. Wow. Never again. Wow. wow. I was never so glad to have a VIP pass <laughs> <laughs> to be under the shade. Fuck man, and I still was burnt to a crisp that show. Oh man. Um. So so Jay and and a, and a little bit gonna ask a lot more uh, about you know, your own development as a musician and, uh, yeah, and the scene cool. and all. Uh, just a couple a couple more minutes on Castle Heights. I mean, I know there's a lot that can be shared about Castle Heights, but um, uh, but Phil and Muttley, if you all just want to share some of your um, favorite memories from Castle Heights, whatever that might be, whether it's shows, not shows, whatever it might be. For me, it's the friendships yeah. um, that have lasted so many years. It's the camaraderie while we were playing. Yeah, when, you know, we're friends, we're, we're so all close, but when we played together, it's like, who's going to take whose lunch money? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So we can have the bragging rights on that. And, but that motivated all our bands, you know, to do what we do at the highest level that we can do it. Yeah. And I think that we pushed each other to greatness, you know, and um, the people, the staff, uh, is what I think of the most just having somewhere to belong um, and, and to think that a Bronx kid made a home in Queens in a little fucking bar but I would go there religiously because I, that's where I wanted to be I didn't want to be here in yeah. I wanted to be there yeah. talking, hugging people high-fiving people, congratulating bands on their good sets mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying developing these relationships that um, have lasted all these years. When Will comes in that door later on, I'm gonna hug the shit out of him. Yeah. You know, that, those are the kinds of memories that I hold to this day. All the people that were great to him growing up. So many things I could say about Castle, uh, but you know, I want to thank them. I want to thank them for helping Irate become what it became, for helping me mature as a man and as a father, and um, you know, life lessons that that I'll take. To the end of time. Yeah. For me, it's kind of the same because you got the two things that Phil just mentioned. You got the band side of it. Uh, I had played in other bands, but I joined Build the Club in 2001. And in that short time, and then after, you know, short time meaning the, the time that Castle Heights was still open, but even long after. Our bands evolved in a certain way because it was like you said, where it's iron sharpens iron, and like we would go, and it was always a friendly competition. But we weren't fucking around. Like we would go and we would play different places together, and you know the lunch money thing was a term that we came up with at some point because we're trying to get we're, we're trying to take somebody's lunch money, and it was you know Sworn Enemy was kind of on their own path. So, so I don't want to exclude them from this, but but they were kind of doing their own thing and and, and 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 taking their own road. So it was really Billy Club and I rate and EGH. Billy Club and I rate shared a rehearsal space yeah. in Mount Vernon. So we were around each other all the time. All the time. Uh, EGH, we were around a lot as well, but we didn't have the same kind of relationship just because we weren't sharing a space like that. 
Um, but we always were trying to one up each other. We we made it a point that we we would never just because of the way we operate, we would never want to be at anything less than top notch anyway. But we encouraged each other with that. Yeah. So that was a big part of it, and that all came from you know Castle Heights was kind of where. That was the dojo for us. That was where we went and and sharpened our, our skills more than anywhere else. And we would take it from there and take it out to different places. We'd go to Pennsylvania, we'd go to Albany, we'd go to Connecticut, we'd go down south, we'd go all over. But that was that was the dojo. I'm most grateful for for them. They're like we're like that. Yeah, and we're still really, like that. We really truly are. Um, because the other part of it, you have the performance side, which we take very seriously because that's that's what we do. Because if people are coming and paying money to see us, yeah. you don't you don't want to bullshit. Like like you ever go see a big show and see them just fuck up all over the place? Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I'm never comfortable with that. I've never been comfortable with that. None of us are, and that's why, part of why we're tight like we are. Uh, it, but then you also have the friendship side. We've been friends for a long time, and it's not just like we'll see each other at shows. Weddings, funerals, come on, baby come on. showers, supporting this fool. Yes. Yeah. Because here he is. At a school town show, yeah. and who's yeah. there? Like all my yeah, great come. guys, <laughs> and like me, like ten deep. Wow! Yeah. So yeah. you know, but but imagine you know the music, and it's like all, and, and you're a fan of these bands, and then all of a sudden those guys are there at some school town show. It's amazing, you know. And our relationship with Jay is not conventional. Yeah. Like a father and son, sure, great bonded family, and all that, but they're still. You know, like, I'm going to do me, I'm going to do me. Yeah. You know, because of the age difference. Yeah. You know, sure. That's not how I raised him. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's literally, like, my best friend. Yeah. We have so much, like, in common. Yeah. It's amazing. In a lot of ways, we're kind of like the same dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like watching myself grow up all over again. Yeah. It's like it's saying, like, we do a horror podcast. Yeah. Uh, guitar yeah. flicks and horror flicks, right? So, yeah, yeah. Every month we do this shit, we wind up with the same list. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like we have the same choices. It gets kind of annoying. But I'm not even talking about it. Yeah, but it gets kind of annoying. Like, Fuck, you can't pick something else and vice versa. Um, but even the dudes that I don't have so much in common with, especially uh, musically, I'm looking at you, Mr. Oreo. Uh, uh, but I love all these guys to death. And yeah, the feeling is mutual. Yeah, um, and it'll always be that way. Yeah, he's guys, one of us. These yeah. guys were there at like my stepfather's funeral viewing. Yeah. Wow. They were there with me at like my talent shows. They were there with me at my first show, which is ironic too, because you were talking about being jealous of them for their first show. Glenn came to me, my first show, which is at Gramercy Theater, and he was like, Oh fuck you, you know, we had earned this shit. You know, and here you, know, you walk, you get this free ride, like busting my balls and yeah. shit. With this first on. show uh, was with me and Judas syndrome. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Uh, because some of the guys had quit. So I I and I, I you know, put him in there and Nanda. Uh-huh. So they helped me out for that show, Gramercy Theater, and that was his first fucking show, this fucking guy. Which we'll have to get wow. into. Yeah. Yeah. So Nando, Nando, and I, Nando and I have had a tremendous yes. journey too. That Nando is his guitar mentor, his Yoda. The whole thing. That's yeah. right. I'm Luke Skywalker. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> actually been a picture that for years, Glenn is great with the Photoshop. Oh, I, I know. always wanted know. him to Photoshop me and Nando in that image of Luke and Five <laughs> with Yoda on his back and shit like that. <laughs> Nando on your back. <laughs> if, you, if you ever been in the grid with me and Nando Redrum, that is the most accurate depiction of he and I <laughs> with guitars in our hands is that Dagobah system scene yeah. in That's um, funny. Uh, so episode five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, love yeah. his relationship with Nando. I love it. I love Nando. The reason why we're Knights of the Black is because I love what they do. Yeah. And they've created this this amazing record, which still needs to be finished, but it is a great record. Yeah, yeah. And when people finally hear it, they're going to be like, fuck, this is fucking awesome. And the talent this kid has is through the charts, man. And That's I, right. I'm not just saying that as his father. He can back that up. Absolutely. Because they generate. Yeah. Yeah, they do that thing. And we got together and, and 
from early on, like Phil, Phil mentioned, you know, at, at, at one point I was staying in his mother's house. Jay would come over, we'd talk about gear and stuff. I'd end up fixing his guitars up, restringing them, setting them up. Um, so he's just been around this, but it's it's the whole family thing. And just to wrap up what we were talking about, with what we took from Castle Heights and just in general, like I said, weddings, baby showers, funerals. We've been there for each other for all this stuff. Uh, and that's the bond that we have. And without Castle Heights, it wouldn't, be the same because that was that was the central spot and that's where our relationships where we grew up. really blossomed into what they are. And again, twenty something years later, these relationships are still strong. We're still supporting each other. We're still doing our thing. Supporting each other as musicians and in life. Again, weddings, funerals birthdays, all kinds of stuff this is what we do. You have yeah, no yeah. idea. Sorry. You have no idea how emo I was last week. <laughs> when <laughs> I, I, I'm not ashamed to say this. When 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 I'm stressed out about this whole thing, this performance thing, and then Saturday comes and all my people come. Yeah. That I didn't even know. I knew he was coming, I knew some people were coming. But the outpouring of people, a lot of them Castle Heights. Yes. Just and, to see me to get on there again. Musicians wow. and fans. Musicians, musicians and fans. fans. Just yep. to, for, for four minutes of my time up there. Wow. Mm. It's incredible. I cannot say enough about I was super emo after, like, in my feels about that shit because it's, it's, it's telling of what Castle Heights is. Yeah. And was. Yeah. And the family part of it. Like, I saw people last week I haven't seen in 10, 15 years. Wow. You know? Uh, it was beautiful. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, obviously there were other venues open at the time too, but, you know, at a time when a lot of the older venues had closed down and all, all it took was this one small little venue out in, you know, Queens to yeah. keep, keep the scene alive and spawn the next Cause, generation. Because you always have that flip of venues over the years. And, and like I said, you'll, you'll have different homes. And, and other scenes have that too, because I know in Jersey, for a long time, Jersey had Studio One, and and there were different places. Pipeline where, and shit like that. Pipeline, yeah. and and uh, you you know you had plenty of places in Pennsylvania like that too. Every scene kind of has their own home, but we were lucky to have that spot where we had a different type of relationship with the staff, and that helped everything flourish because because of that we we formed these bonds within the bands, but also with everybody else that hung out there. And, and I mention a lot of people that are fans because for us, like music is like what we do from like when I was young, like music was like my religion. But I also recognize that there are a lot of people that just love music. Like yeah. there are people that don't play an instrument at all, but come to all of our shows. Yeah. And it's just because they love the music and they love the scene and they love the friendships and, and the relationships. And, and it's a different perspective from what we have because we're looking at it kind of in a business sense too and, and performance and things like that. And these people just love what we do and come hang out. Yeah. So, so I always try to acknowledge that because it's so different from the way I think. But it, it, it's awesome in its own way because there's no agenda. It's not like they're looking like what are these what guitars are these guys playing or something. Like they're just going and having a good time. Because they love it. Yeah, because they they enjoy it, and, and we appreciate that. Absolutely. So, Jay, why don't you, if you can even remember? I mean, you were obviously in the scene from the second you were born. Um, but do you remember some of the first music that like registered in your ears that you remember? Oh, like you know, this is this band or this is this album. Like, do you remember? Have memories oh. of that? Uh, I remember it vividly, actually. So, growing up. You know, my father and my mother, they split up when I was young. I was like a year old, a little over a year. You guys moved out there. So we were living in that Bainbridge um, attic apartment. Yeah. At the time, I was like a year and a half. Like, so, you know, I just, like I said, I had those still shot images in mind of that place. But after that, um, 
when my mother left that place, she moved to Ford Independence, that building oh, okay. that on the Bailey side, you go yeah. up to the lobby and the seventh floor on the other side. We lived in that building. Oh, okay, okay, I forget okay. which floor, but I know yeah. that we lived in that building. I remember the apartment layout. But I would go back and forth my whole life Yeah. between Pop's crib and my mom's crib. Yeah. So when I was with my mom's crib, she had this babysitter on the 11th floor that used to watch me. The woman, an old, old Spanish lady, she had uh, uh, like a 16-year-old daughter and like a 14 and 15-year-old son. Uh, the sons, they, they were lame. Like they used to... You know, they used to try to bully me, but I thought they were lame. Yeah. So, like, you know, I'm, I'm this four-year-old kid, and I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, you know, you're a loser. <laughs> so, I liked the girl, so I always yeah. wanted to hang out with the girl. I was yeah. always in her room with her. She thought I was cute, so she loved me. And she always used to watch, like, Insane, Backstreet Boys. Uh-huh, like, uh-huh. that's what was on. So, that was my musical exposure. But one day, she had this older man living in there with her, and he busted out the acoustic guitar. So seeing that for the first time, hearing somebody play that, like I was, I was drawn to that. Yeah. And then at that point, I wanted to go because he had always been showing me Metallica and all that, like uh, more against my will at first. Sure. You know, sure. Um, sure. Um, you had no choice. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember at first, like the first exposure to Metallica was the Black Album. Okay. He had this stereo system in the house, and that was the first album that he was like, "Here, you know, listen to this." And I was so caught up in whatever this girl was listening to that I didn't really give a shit at the time. Yeah, sure. But after that guitar situation, I made a conscious decision to want to sit and listen to a CD or a tape. Yeah. So that first tape that I ever heard that I put his um, tape player in my ears, it was uh, 2000. It was Dying Feet Just Destroyed the Opposition. Oh, God. I was four years old. I was four years old. You were four years old. So and that shit blew me away. Wow. And John Gallagher came on with that fucking oh my voice. God. And it scared the shit out of me, but I loved it. I was like, what is this? What is this? Wow. This is awesome. Pair that with another album he had bought recently at the time that he used to, he left it in the player. Yeah, uh, and I used to go and just try to play what was ever in the radio, and that album wound up being Macabre Sinister Slaughter. Wow! You know, so <laughs> my first introduction to this right album the is guy Fetus and Macabre. <laughs> so I pretty much hit the fucking ground running with that shit. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and and it would make, oh, and I loved it. Like his voice scared me at first. Yeah, but like after a few minutes listening to it and just like the grooves mixed with the technicality of the riffs, like, I fucking, I was like, yo, this is that shit right here. Like, this is it. Like, I need this. Um, And, you know, as things would continue, I I started to show the interest. And, you know, he took that seriously. Yeah. And was like, I'm going to nurture this. Where most parents would try to nip that in the butt right right away. And be like, what the fuck are you listening to? Like, what are you doing? Like, um, he took me to JC's house. When they were recording um, that, it was a three song irate demo. What was it? CPR, uh, maybe Supremacy. Step to my world. Oh, Supremacy. Not Step Supremacy. To my world. And no. Malignant. Okay, yes. yeah, there you go. Wow. So um, I remember hanging out in the booth that day. There yeah. wasn't a lot of music stuff going on that day because they were doing vocals and backups. Okay. So, like, I remember watching Nando Red Room do backups in JC Studio. Uh, I remember taking the drive up there. Wow. It's the first time I'm kind of like hanging out. Like Mile Pack, New York. Uh-huh, uh-huh. that's right. Yeah. It's the first time I'm really hanging out with, like, UV and Nick. I had uh-huh. seen Nando a lot because, like, Nando was the Bronx guy. And so was UV, but, you know, UV Rays wasn't always the hang out with kids type of uh, guy that he is now. Yeah, sure, <laughs> Especially, sure, 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 sure. you know, back in the day where he was instant joint. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, you know, we, we took the trip up there, and those guys were cool. Um, they, you know, very receiving of me, even from day one, like we were walking through the studio, I'm looking at like the guitars and like the drum tones and all that kind of shit, soundproofing, like, the, you know, JC's big analog setup, because it was like, you know, what, like 2000 or something like that, so yeah. you had the analog setup, you didn't have all this IMAX shit, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, I think he was just starting Pro Tools, right, I, I, I was going to say, he was probably just starting to go digital yeah. at that point. So, Nando Red Room's doing backups for CPR, um, and then he goes in to record something, I think it's like the end breakdown or some shit, and he looks at me, he goes, when I finish, I'm going to give you 
you a signal, and I want you to go in the mic and say, take that, you pigs. <laughs> so that's what I did. I had no, not even an inkling of an idea of what the song was about, police brutality. I didn't know any of that shit. I was yeah, just like, yeah, oh, yeah. hanging out with these cool guys, and I'm in the studio, and I'm four years old. Um, and yeah, so I did that. And that was fucking cool because I remember seeing Nando, Nick, and you just in the back, like, oh, <laughs> we got so hard for that shit. Yeah. It, was, it was perfect. And JC, too. Yeah. Uh, they all loved it. That was a winner, uh, for sure. Yeah. I still have that demo in my house. But yeah, man, after that, we'd go home, and at that point, I was hooked. And then yeah. all these guys would come in uh, for like my fifth or sixth birthday party, I got my first Walkman. Uh huh. Right? And all these guys would go buy me CDs and shit like that. My dad would buy me CDs. I'm sure Gary and Chris have hooked me up with CDs over the years. Nando gave me Injustice for All. UV gave me Master of Puppets. Wow. Nick Irene would give me tab books. Gary was the guy who showed me how to change the strings on my first fucking guitar. Wow. And like taught me about Drop C when I asked him how to play some kill switch riffs. Um, uh, so that was like my early childhood. And I was just like, I had a hunger for it, you know, the music, but also another thing that would influence my musical prowess would be like video games. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. I'm sure. a huge video game nerd, especially being born in 96, like uh -huh. I, at the beginning of uh, 64 and PlayStation 1, all the classics like the Zeldas, yep. the Silent Hills, the Resident Evils, the Final Fantasies. Like, the musical compositions of that shit, in addition to the music, yeah. used to just blow my mind. Yeah, sure. And then pair that with these guys buying me albums. Like, when, when they gave me Rust in Peace, and I heard that, and I heard Marty play guitar, uh -huh. that was the moment where I said, that's it, I gotta do this. This is, this is my goal. Didn't you play... Uh, a video game thing at one of the talent shows? Yeah, I did. I yeah. played a Mega Man. Played so a oh, yeah. shit, okay. Man yeah. X6 Blaze Heat Mix, for example. Wow. Show. Yeah, that would be later in my teenage years. But um, even from Jump, like, hearing all this music, like, my life was all music, so by the time I got my, like, it wasn't my first guitar, it was his first guitar, it was a black Ibanez, but I used to play it all the time. Yeah, how old were you? When I, you... Was, I had to be, like, six at this okay. point. Okay, yeah. So... I remember one day I was holding it and I was like strumming and combining like strumming the open strings with playing individual strings and then I performed it to him and my grandmother as like a song, you know, because I had that like intuitiveness to kind of create something like construct because, you know, when I would listen to these things, I would notice, all right, certain things will repeat, uh -huh. certain things, like there's a structure to this. Yeah. I picked up on that very early. Pair that with hanging out with these guys like... Guys like Gary are always giving me like business uh, influence and tell me about like the, like how to do certain things with guitar or how to interact with people or you know then my father also teaching me like about bands and like you know introducing me to people like uh, being a kid and meeting like um, going to Irving Plaza and meeting like the dudes from Agents of Man uh -huh. or like Cousin Joe or fucking your guys' man who wrote it for Slayer. Oh, uh, yeah, Warren, Warren. Uh, yeah. uh, Frank yeah. Phillip from Fahrenheit, uh -huh. um, you know, the go to Mensis dudes, like just all these people, you know, they would just continue to play these roles. And as I would get older and older, I would just do more shit. I started getting into Guns N' Roses and Slash. Buckethead. Buckethead was a big one for me. I fucking sweated Buckethead so hard <laughs> in elementary school because he could just play like nobody's business. Um, and then by the time I got to middle school, Barry was the security guard at um, 368. Yeah. And so he got me affiliated with the school band guy. Ah, Antonio I see, I see, I see. Yandolo, who That dude would become like a second dad to me. Wow. Because when I was in school, I always wanted to be in that music room. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, I didn't give a shit about anything else. You know, as much to his chagrin <laughs> as, as a youth, but like, Having that interest and then having these guys, but then also the new generation, yeah. because now after 2007, which my first show would be, let me backtrack a little bit, my first show would be in 2006, right? It would be myself, Gary, my father, and Gary's brother, Chris, uh, at the IZOD Center, which doesn't even exist anymore. It's right? still there, but it's not used. It's, it's only not used, used for It's not a concert venue anymore. So we saw Slayer. Uh, with Lamb of God, uh -huh. Macedon, Children of Bodom, and Nine Eyes Blue. Wow. Yeah, front row seats. We're right by the soundboard. So it, it was all, it was open floor. So you could go 
Right, but we were right when the seats began. We were, oh, we were about, behind the no, sound. You were literally behind. You, 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 right, yeah, you guys were really bad. Yeah. Yeah. You and Chris were talking. Oh, yes, you guys were okay. up there. We're, we're yeah. Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. So we saw yeah. Jay Weinberg, uh, uh, Max Weinberg, and then Max Weinberg, the sound people there. Yeah. I remember that so, I had to adjust somebody in that show. So <laughs> we're right behind the soundboard, right? And there's like people there, like Julia from Fuse was there. Yeah. And she loved, like, she called with the man. She was like, oh, hi. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't even know who the fuck she was, but like, I thought it was cool. It's like, oh, look, pretty goth chick, like, talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> And then, like he said, we wind up seeing Max Weinberg pull up, you know, from the Conan O'Brien show, drummer. And security don't know who the fuck he is. And he's like, the fuck you mean? I'm Max Weinberg. You know, like, they're about to kick his yeah, ass. He's pulling his car. Uh, <laughs> and they didn't give a shit. <laughs> and they were about to pounce on him yeah. until somebody explains to them who he was. Yeah. Listen, he plays for Springsteen doesn't mean he's not tough. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But, uh, and we saw fucking Slayer. And that shit, to even prepare for that show... This guy made me listen to South of Heaven, Rain of Blood, and um, Seasons of the Abyss three times each uh-huh. for like a whole three weeks. <laughs> Every day I had to listen to like, it was my homework, you know, <laughs> just to prepare for the show. <laughs> and, but that would start the beginning of what would be the rest of my life. Yeah, for the sure. The road trip with these guys, the banter, the listening to, oh, I like this band, and him being like, nah, fuck that. These guys suck. <laughs> uh, or or him liking this band and like his brother not liking you know like just just lots of hours of of um, shit classic talking. banter and shit talking <laughs> hey. yeah lots of hate lots, lots, lots of like you know I grew up around <laughs> experts I'll, yeah I'll yeah for that. sure um, that would help me in school later on um, <laughs> <laughs> I just gradually progressed from there I went from going to big shows to then smaller clubs like the year after that no that year two thousand six December. I went to Irving Plaza for the first time. Okay. And that's where I met you guys, this dude, Rody from Slayer. That's where I met Cousin Joe. I'm pretty sure that's where I met Frank the first time when I was a little kid. We saw Guar. Oh, Guar was, was playing. Okay. show. They were on the, what was that, uh, Beyond Hell, I think. Yeah. Uh, it was when they were doing the Jucifer thing. Yeah. And they were in the Eight Layers of Hell. So, and then after that, I had my first hardcore show. Which would be in the Bronx. Okay, what was your first beach bar? Right, you said it was the beach oh, bar. Oh, it was a, uh, it was uh, a beach club. Oh, one of the beach clubs. Okay. It was the Mannheim Beach Club. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, it Who? was Bronx Underground show. Yes. It was Endwell Billy Club. Billy Club. I can't remember who else was. Was that the club that um, Brian Darwas was associated with from? I don't know. Okay. Bronx I know Underground. He was, no, well, was Adam and Dave. Bronx Underground was Adam, Dave, yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. They would do the church usually. Yeah. yeah so but so then in the summertime, they, they used to do the beach club. Because the Manhattan Beach Club, it isn't there anymore. It's something else now. It, it changed the name. Because I was actually looking it up recently because we were just talking about it. Um, but yeah, that was 2007. Yeah. Okay. Because that was, yeah, that was, I'm trying to remember who the other bands were, and I can't remember. Uh, I know that I measured that unit of time by the fact that Glenn had no afro. That's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's certainly a uh, well, way to remember the Glenn, Glenn had no afro, and that was the only time that my kids went to a show. Oh. My twins were like two. Yeah. Or, or no, it was the summertime, so they were like almost two. Okay. And Martin's son was like uh, a toddler. Yeah, he was at that show. because it was family day. So like, I see. Jay is there with Phil. My kids are there. Martin's kids are there. All like all of our oh, kids. Yeah, are there. Yeah, and that was the first time I ever saw my father perform in a club environment uh, because they played Narco Cabron. Yeah. And of course, you know, he does the intro verse to that. And then by the end of the song, you know, he turns, he goes, that goes out to Jay Vibes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I was standing behind Glenn. That was probably the beginning of me losing my hearing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I had no ear protection. I was just raw dogging it, a little kid. <laughs> standing next to the China symbol. Wow. Which if you know Glenn, you know that that's his number one <laughs> right there. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing, mm-hmm. like, um, two stories I want that you skip. Number one was the day he asked me for his own guitar. Okay. It was towards his sixth grade graduation. I wanted a warlock. And he oh, wanted yeah. this warlock. 
And I said, I don't know if I want to buy you one because at that point he's a kid. And, you know, one day something's cool, but then the next day yeah. it's not. Yeah, sure. And to me it was like, I don't want to invest in a, not a high-end guitar, but a, a decent guitar. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, because those you're were not, not cheap. Yeah, those were not cheap. They, they if used you're to not have gonna the cheap ones, but they are hard yeah. to find. But he looked at me and he's, I'll never forget this. He looked at me and said, Dad, if you buy me a guitar, I'll never put it down. Yeah. And so I That's took him right. at his word. Yeah. And on his sixth grade graduation, his mother and I took him to Sam Ash or Man Music. music. Man music. Yeah. And we said, Pat, you Man deserve Man. this. Wow. You, you did good in school. Here it is. I still have this guitar. Wow. Wow. It's an ESP AX50. And surprisingly, it you know, looks years a little ago, like a warlock. Oh, it's got, yeah, it looks like a warlock. It's got. Holes Another in it, it's pointy like guitar, up, you know, from being left against the wall and all that. Yeah, you know, sure. Being a kid. But um, um, actually, before that, even uh, my very first guitar was given to me from Nando Redbuck. It was that Ibanez that he yeah. sanded it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys he used to perform. Yeah, yeah he used to use that. That, that was that was uh, his main guitar. So look, my first guitar was a fucking irate stage used guitar. Who, can, <laughs> who else can say that? And then being yeah. a dickhead wanting to get girls in high school, I traded it for like an expensive Pico. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Terrible, um, terrible decision. Fire. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, that guitar that I got at Manny's Music, ESP AX50, I still have it. And I feel like what, like in, right before the pandemic, just out of curiosity, I plugged it in. Yeah. Just to see, expecting it to sound like shit, but like, believe it or not, that guitar, like, you know, if you were to shape it with like a little overdrive or whatever, you could get it to sound pretty decent. Wow. You know, and I was surprised by that. I'm like, wow, for a $250 thing in like 2006, like this is, Still has this is not bad. Decent sound. But that was the time that the guitar thing became serious. Yeah. And I and started going to Nando's house really, at that time. That's when you started going to Nando's. Yeah, when I would start going to Nando's house, yeah. at first it was like, you know, minor. Like when I was little, he tried at first, but I was still too young to really grasp anything. Yeah, that. sure. When I had my first real shit, I started going to his house and we started going over like chord progressions, you know, little scales here and there. Because he was still learning at that point too. Sure. Like me, he was, I mean, he had his dad that showed him the ropes, but he was like me, somebody to, to push the fucking envelope yeah. and try to soak in as much information as he could. He wanted to be the best. I grew up in the Dragon Ball Z era, so I had Goku mentality. I wanted to be the best <laughs> at guitar too. Um, and, and like, he would see where I would go with things and he would help me change certain things up. He would be like, I see what you're doing here. Try holding the pick this way. Huh. Or try using your wrist instead of your whole fucking arm. Or yeah. like, you know, and then like showing me like more structured things. I would come and be like, hey, I like this riff. And he would start plugging into Guitar Pro for me so that I could like create my own songs yeah. and develop my musical prowess and you know, even from the beginning, like my first song was very melodic death metal. Uh, uh, I was always into that sound. Like yeah, I was sure. always very like musically chaotic. Being a huge Black Dahlia Murder fan, which would also be his doing, um, that probably had something to do with it. But like those guys are very musical, therefore I was very musical. So Nando would see this in me, and he would do his best to nurture that wow. and guide my madness to be more methodical so that I could grow and become a much better guitar player a lot faster. Sure. And it worked because then by the time I was in middle high school, the high school kids wanted to recruit me when I was in seventh grade. My wow. best friend, Edward Acosta, <laughs> Ed, I love you. He fucking didn't like me at first because that's just how he is. But then he would see me play guitar and I was the shit. And I used to hang out with the 10th, 11th graders wow. as a seventh grader <laughs> uh, because I could outshred all of them. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and it would just continue from there. I would start playing talent shows. My first talent show, like half of BCS was there, half of Ryrick was there. Uh, Ian from Stifling and Black was there. I believe Chris Villari was there, uh, which you know would mean a lot to me because my generation growing up, like my era hardcore bands were like Enwell, Athletis, through the fucking Discipline, Rest in Peace, which is probably like the kings for me. I love Mike. Mike uh, next to this man right here, Mike Centrone. Is probably my favorite singer in all the New York scene. No disrespect to Great anybody singer. else, but that dude is is he's just such a talented individual, and I love him eternally. 
And, um, and he's another one who is heavily met, influenced by us. He's yeah. heavily influenced, yeah. and we met him through Castle Heights. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. This is when you used to play Castle Heights, and that's how we first met. Seeing those guys as a kid before I could dance and stuff like that, and then eventually getting to the point where you know they broke up and then they reunite years later, and I'm setting it off in Blackboard 51 in Queens and shit like that. But even before all that, just you know, uh, by the time he was in Judas Syndrome, I was going to locals, I was going to FLC, I would yeah. take that trip to Pelican and take that bus over there and shit like that. And all the all the big shows we would go to, because I would do that, but then I would go with these guys to see like Iron Maiden and Metallica. And yeah, Maiden. one of the things I remember uh-huh. was going, the first time you saw Maiden. Mm-hmm. It was a talking, secret until we're there. We're, yeah, we kept it a secret. Wow. Yeah. Surprised him with it, and then like, he, I forget what song you mentioned, but like, is is going? He, he's like, I hope they play whatever song. I don't remember. It had song. to have been either "Hallowed Be Thy Name" or um, "Ace Is High," which they no, before. it was it was like a more obscure song. More obscure. Because I'm like, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, how, how how old are you? Like, you know, Maiden like that? Like, it's crazy. <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah, it was um, definitely some obscure song. Like, it was still life, but it was something like that. It was like, yeah, most, like your average, you know, casual Maiden fan might not even know the song. Well, at that point, I had so much shit between my ears. Death metal, grindcore, yep. hardcore, slam, power metal, hair metal, rock and roll, classic rock, hip-hop, bachata, salsa, mm-hmm. jazz, fucking... I was like that, yeah. basically, always. Sure. Like I, I'm well, a sponge. sponge. You were you were like a sponge with music, right. but that also applied to us yeah. because you were just just by being around us, you would soak up so much different stuff. Whether it was like me teaching you like technical stuff about fixing guitars or whatever, or like just watching how we would perform, yeah. or scales and and you know technical music stuff or, or even just absorbing like like what you said like we mentioned different bands to you or whatever or even just hanging out just the general wisdom yeah and fun times to be absorbed from I mean guys. this kid is spoiled rotten <laughs> <laughs> like, how many like how I don't remember how old you were at the time but how many kids are in a fucking kill switch bus <laughs> <laughs> with Gary. Yeah. And, and hanging yeah. out with Howard fucking Jones. Yes. Vaughn Lewis. Vaughn yes. Lewis. I love you, you love forever, brother. Yeah. Um, Vaughn yeah. Lewis is the greatest person we know, and he is responsible for a lot of our good memories together. Yeah. yeah. Hooking us up to see all these bands that he's managed. I have him to thank for half the greatest nights yes. in my life. Wow. And he's a man that I don't think he understands how much I love him. <laughs> we, we love yeah. Vaughn Lewis yes. with all our hearts. And Kenny. And Kenny yep. Gaber, um, and, and they provided so many awesome opportunities for this kid to meet mega stars. So much so that even child. people that know him, w- without even meeting me, would reach out and be like, "Hey, you want to come to the show tonight? Like your man from um, Fit for an Autopsy and shit like that." Oh, I would go that, see them. I would, he would guest list me without me even right. meeting him at but like Santos all, party house. Again, wow. going back to what we were talking about before, these are the relationships that we've built over the years. And we can't even just say Castle Heights because we no, we went beyond we a lot of different like, like Pat. We go way back with Pat. Same with Vaughn. I remember when Vaughn was taking pictures yeah. of H like two O. But now, wow, he's he's built. Now he's got his own company. Right, he's, he's built tons of bands on this whole other there. thing for himself. Now, what I can say too is that there is a flip side to that. Me and Gary were talking about this on the train the other day. Uh, having so much exposure. To that stuff, I'm living a rock star life without ever having done shit. <laughs> so it's like, in certain instances, I would always play, but then that would also hinder my seriousness and buckling down on my own sure, musical sure. shit because I would always be able to just reap the benefits without putting in the work, yeah. you know, which would be a lot of people would kill to be in some of the situations that I've been in. Sure. And, <laughs> <laughs> Like, for example, I brought up the Black Dahlia murder earlier. Trevor, may he rest in peace, <laughs> that really rocked my world when he passed away, especially Our world. in the way that he passed. Um, I got to say that I became an acquaintance of his, and, like, you know, he knew me when he would see me. 
just from the years of support, yes, but also where I come from, him yeah. knowing about Iraq, him, you know, or like guys like the dudes from Killswitch, same deal, or like Tim Ruins, or like all these people that I worship, that I looked up to and wanted to be like, you know, I had, I always had a, a foot in the door yeah. for that environment. And I always had my father and these guys to thank for that. Um, as an adult now, I am able to get my shit in order and, and, you know, do the things that I want to do musically. But for a long time, yeah, spoiled is the best way to put it, man. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, who could, if, if it just comes to you, you know what I mean? Yeah, How yeah, are you yeah. going to be motivated to, to do it? Yeah, sure. You know? so, sure. But I think the key with that is that you recognize that and you don't take it for granted. That's Absolutely. right. You, you're not just expecting to walk into every show and you're not expecting like you don't have expectations and that's the key like right. you don't you don't feel like you deserve something and like my first show outside of school that I ever played was at Gramercy Theater 23rd Street playing for fucking Within the Lumens Despised Icon Lorna Shore which is huge now uh, yeah. Circuit of Suns you wow. know like and like I said Glenn of course is giving me shit about that he's like you know you're looking motherfucker you know we had to earn this shit and he's right, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I, I am a blessed soul, and I have always felt that. Even if, you know, I, I had to be cool to not be hated by all these guys, <laughs> you know? It, it helped that, that the... Um, Don't be a dick. You're right. It, it helped that the chemistry was always there. Yeah. For example, one, one of the highlights of my fucking life, I've been dying to talk about this, is when we did uh, the Bottom of the Barrel music video. I'm in yeah. that shit. I'm the kid in that shit. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, kudos, kudos to the BCS guys. I, cause I think it was one of the big lens idea to put me as the office intern. Yes. <laughs> to kind of play it off as to why I'm so yes. young in the video. Yeah. But we were yeah. figuring out who, was gonna, who we were going to bring in. And we were like, well, Jake can be the intern. I play summer youth intern in that video. <laughs> and it was actually a hard time because I had just lost my stepfather like weeks yeah. before. Yeah. These guys were there with me at my viewing. They were all supportive of me. Gary, Barnan, Malone, Glenn. Like, they all called me and they were all there for me, you know. And then to lift my spirits, they decided to have me be a part of that weeks later. And wow. I remember taking that trip to Martin was working there at that That's office right. at the time. And we spent a whole day there filming that shit. And like watching the outtakes and stuff like that, <laughs> I bet that like, funny. <laughs> just just seeing that, but having been there, yeah. like to remember all the shit. Dude, right. What a what a trip! What a day! How old, how old were you? Yeah, 14, old? 14, 14. You're fourteen. You're fourteen. I was fourteen, and it was like damn. At that point, I was also kind of like you know I was going through my awkward teen phase. Yeah, and sure, like sure. That. But I was just happy to be in the fucking room. Yeah. With like, you know, I'm there with all the BCS, it's my pops, it's Jay Ray, the original high rate bass player, uh Gary's brother Chris, another another man that I love to death. Uh it was the first time I ever met Glenn's boy Jay Biggs. He's there because he's in that video too. Uh, another great dude, uh, not a musical guy, but just a good dude to hang out. Um and yeah, man, like it is so much shit that I can't even sit here and name all of it. You were just hanging out watching us throw paper. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and like kicking the fucking copy machine around, and, uh, you know, like pumping Martin out the whole time, which is always fun. Uh, like I remember, I kind of felt guilty about it because everybody's like, you know, you can't hear the audio, but everybody's like dissing him, and I didn't want to because I was like, so I'm there just mouthing like yeah, that shit. But, uh -huh. but, but I didn't stick him good with the phone. But also, <laughs> he was walking by. Oh, but also, man. remember, for all the shit that Martin took, he got everybody. He did. He Except, shot us all. The only person he doesn't kill is the girl. Is me. Oh, that's right. Because I had to leave. <laughs> that's true. Because I was, I was going to roadie for somebody at, I think it was Grammar's. You, you, you see you with the Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, he, yeah, but yeah. you see him kill everybody except for me, which we didn't realize until later. That wasn't that's planned. That's funny. <laughs> We always said that maybe that's, you escaped. The lead. that's the lead for the sequel. <laughs> I love filming getting shot 
I was in, I was in like a full suit. Like a, but like, being, being the young guy, I'm the only guy who's not really like afraid to full throttle throw myself yeah, on the floor. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, the rest of us are too old. So I was having a great time. And Slim filmed that fucking scene like 15, 20 times in a row. And I'm just throwing myself on the floor as hard as I can and like sliding <laughs> in a suit to the door in a suit. We all wear a suit too. And I remember him yelling at me. He's like, dude, you're fucking so dirty. Like, like stop being an asshole. And, uh, uh, wow. Um, now, so many connections between our parents. Absolutely. It's, it's insane. Yeah. Uh, but as far as his development, I wanted to be the best follower I could be because I grew up without one. Yeah. You know, and yeah, we're cool now and all that, but for most of my life, he wasn't there for me. Sure. So when he came along, I, I swore that I would be everything that I wanted a father to be. Yeah. And that my mother was to me. Yeah, sure. You know? Um, and I think that we, we did that. And then some. And then some. And uh, I'm so proud of that. that it's the most beautiful thing I've ever done. Day, man, it's beautiful. Like, we still do shit musically. I still do shit musically with Gary. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's just natural for it. Like, this is all organic. Yeah. This is not forced. This is not something that we'd be like, hey, we need to do this to look. But f no, this is none of that. That's right. These, uh, this is my father. These are my uncles. And that's that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and all the brothers that I've made along the way, my age or older or, or younger than him, but older than me, like the, like the doomsday morning guys, you know, like, or, or fucking stifling neglect or like not the love or those dudes, you know, like. They were always mad at Cody. They didn't have to be. Yeah. They could have hated on me. But they Will Blackout. Will Blackout. Will Blackout. You know? Uh, admittedly, I, I never got to see Blackout. Yeah. Because, you know, it was before my time. But, like, Will's always been a cool dude to me. Coming over to his house occasionally to hang out. You know what I'm saying? I used to play fucking Call of Duty with Sal Enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Call of Duty 4 on PS3. Uh -huh. And, like, PS3 iChat and shit. You know? Always showed me love to the humanized guys. Fucking, yeah, man, like, it just, it goes so deep that it's more than what a two, a two three hour yeah, yeah, yeah. bit of footage can cover. That's right. You know? That's right. Um, and, and it's not over. Yeah. There's I know. still so much living to be done. Well, his star is yet to, to yeah. shine. Yeah. And, but it's coming. It's yeah. coming sooner Absolutely. than you think. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. You know, more on that as it comes. I don't want to jinx anything. But yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, I'm not done. I see what these guys have done, and and to honor that, to honor everything they've given to me, I look forward to moving that forward, and to introducing everything that I know that I've been exposed to into my generation. And then some. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, Phil um, mentioned earlier that there were a couple stories you wanted to go back to. One was um, Jay asking for his first guitar. Was there another story that you wanted to get in there that, that it occurred to you? Well, no, what just that he was spoiled in, in the okay. whole kill switch got thing it, got and it. the boss and meeting all these rock stars. Like, what kid gets these things? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah, get yeah. it. He didn't get it. Yeah. I, I, I know, think the key with that meeting Corey Taylor together and <laughs> yeah. shit like that. Like, I think the key with that is that one of the things and I'm sure Phil agrees with me on this, and, uh, and I feel this way also. But my kids are on a different path; they're not as into the into music. Like you know, one of my daughters is more into performing, like on the the, the stage, like acting side of things. Uh, we spend a lot of time doing what we do, and this is kind of our legacy at this point. Uh, because we've influenced people, and, and we're always very grateful for that. But one of the things that we always want to do, and I feel this way about Jay, and I'm sure Phil does too, is that we spent a lot of time doing what we do and building what we have. Yeah. And the reputation we have, and the relationships that we have, and things like that. Uh, and, and we never take it for granted but we see the value in that, and it's nice to be able to pass that mm -hmm. along to the next generation. That's right. Uh, all these the interpersonal relationships that we've built over the years, we're talking about Vaughn Lewis or Warren Lee, or all the different people that are in different bands, that we've, you know, we, put, we never thought of it as work, but like these are relationships that we've 
nurtured over the years, whether it's like what we talked about with the five fingers of death or the outside people, because the other thing too is that over time people go in different directions. You know, Lorenzo's sworn enemy now is doing a lot of acting stuff yeah. in Hollywood. Uh, you know, some guys will go from playing in bands and doing more management stuff. Uh, you know, Adam from the Bronx Underground now works for Live Nation. That's right. Uh, Shout out to Adam. All these people go in all different directions, but we've built these relationships over time. And we're able to, to take that and, and continue that and pass our connections, but also our knowledge and wisdom from all the work that we put in, not just the great stuff that we did, yeah. but all the shit that we fucked up. Yeah. All the mistakes. God knows we made. It wasn't a perfect ride. No you, don't, you don't learn without making yeah. mistakes. And we've made plenty of mistakes over the years, but that's how you learn. Like, you don't, you don't learn from doing everything right. It's like, I know I told you this, and I always tell you, young people this when they ask me for advice like play with everybody because you'll learn what works for you but also what doesn't work for yeah you. and it doesn't necessarily mean that the person you're working with is a dick or a bad person or whatever sometimes it's chemistry me and you may not work well together because we just work different sure so the only way for you to learn that is to get out there and do it so we're lucky that we can take all of those lessons that we've learned Pass it on. You still got your own lessons to learn also. It, what we're giving you is not necessarily a blueprint, but it's helpful information that you can take on your own journey. And then keep going from there, and then eventually, maybe you could pass it on to somebody. There was also a thing that, that made it difficult for me as a kid. I always had trouble finding other people to play with. I was going to ask you because, that. Because, yeah. you know, not to toot my own horn, I'm a very humble guy. But I was always far ahead of anybody that I could play with in school. Sure. You know, minus one or two people. Uh, and that was because I had not know that to learn from. I had these guys to show me everything. Um, but, like, not to say that there weren't people that I went to school with who were also into it that would grow up and do their own thing. Yeah. Whether or not we stayed in contact with each other, some of which we certainly didn't. But, you know... I never wanted to be behind something that I didn't believe in. Yeah, sure. In the same way these guys believed in what they were doing. I wanted something that... I, I wasn't hungry to just be on stage with anything the yeah. way that most bands are. Yeah. Start. I have always been a perfectionist, so I'm the guy that I know. If I'm going to put out a record, I want it to be a fucking 12 out of 10. Uh-huh, uh -huh. You know, I want it to be iconic in the way that their shit was iconic, but also take it to the next step. Where, you know, BCS was heavy as fuck and groovy. I want to take that to the next level. Where I rate was methodical and musical. I want to take that to the next step. And, and, and basically put it on crack. Yeah, you know? yeah sure. Uh, <laughs> which with Nice to the Black, uh, the music that we do have pretty much does that. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. That material, at least from a guitar perspective, has been pretty much done for a long time. But even listening to it years later, it still holds, still holds up. This shit smacks you. It really does. Yeah. And you can hear some of it. We did a film <coughs> for his boy Mike Schiff. He did an independent film called History right. of Horror and Metal. Came out like a year ago, right? Right, yeah, right, right, right. Something like that. Yeah. We saw that was a big moment for us seeing our work together in Empire City 25 AMC. Yep, you know, that was fucking amazing. Cool. Yeah. And guys like Rob Zombie, John Five, Kirk Hammond, Brian Slagle, you know, all in that film. Talking yeah. over our music. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Many of those people which I've met, we've met, but... Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I actually met Brian Slagle because of Long Way. So, yeah. at the Black Dahlia Murder Nightbringer CD release party in St. Vitus. Uh, that, was, that actually also helped me get a little closer to Trevor, too, is when he found out the dynamic of the relationship between Ron and I, and also Slagle and, and uh -huh. shit. Uh, but, you know, just uh, with it all in perspective, it's not something that's conventional by any means, but that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Because there's so much to be learned and, and, and gained from the experiences that we've had, uh, past, present, future, you know, nobody does it quite like we do. And that could be a good thing, that could be a bad thing, 
but it is 100 the truth and how. Yeah. It. So, so Jay, I know you played obviously in, in Judas Syndrome and Knights of the Black. Are there other bands that you've played in over the years? Well, I, I had a band that I was in for like two weeks. Oh, uh, okay, I, okay, I, okay. In high school, One of those, yeah, 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 yeah. At high school, I and you. that was with kids that I met at a Judas Syndrome show. I see, I see. Who are in the scene now, Anthony Diaz. You guys okay, know. yeah, yeah. His boys, Mark, and their boy at the time, Andrew, I met them with my brother, Edward. Uh, it was the Judas Syndrome, I Kill Ya. Uh, it was it was a few people at some Manhattan club. I don't think it was Santos Party House, but it was a club that is shut down now. Yeah. Small room. Um, and so I met those dudes, and they're like, yo, we're starting a band. Do you want to? I went to, you know, we jammed out, and it was cool, but I was, I guess, so distracted. I guess the chemistry wasn't there, too. Yeah. So, you know, like, we played some, some riffs that we liked, and they had lyrics that they tried to do over it, but like then they had the name, which I wasn't crazy about, which was Slaughterific. Uh, <laughs> it was know, terrible. Yeah, that, 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 you know, befitting like, of, of young oh, kids. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, then in high school, my band that we would rock the house all the time because we were the house band. Yeah. So we would do more. We would play our set list, but then also like other kids that wanted to perform because this is a Bronx high school. Sure, so sure, you got, sure. got like a lot of young girls that want to perform like Adele or Alicia yep. Keys yep. or all types of shit. So like me and mine, we would be the guys established in the building to play yep. for people. Yep. So because of that, I'm still on their wall as legends of the stage along with many of my friends. That's <laughs> awesome. So yeah, um, so we would do that, but our name was also a terrible name. We would, we would go by Discord. <laughs> which you know now is an app but fuck yeah. all if I knew what that meant as a kid mm-hmm. uh, if it was even a word uh, I think it is but so there was that and then I also tried to start a thrash band pre-COVID okay um, but that while the chemistry was there as friends yeah I was the only guy who was like wanted to play I know? see I'm usually the one it's so who, hard to find it people is, to it, I'm usually the one special. To write the material. That's yeah. not the, the problem. I, yeah. I'll write it, I'll do the guitars, I'll do bass, I'll do drums, you know? Um, but like to find people that can usually play what I write, A, yep. which is usually technically demanding, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Or and B, just like the consistency. The dedication, able, consistency. You know, the dedication, right. the desire to do it. And yeah, I've found kids all throughout my life on the one off that will be down. There was this one guy that I'm from Boris and Kingsbridge, born and raised. I shuffled around like I lived in Soundview, I lived yeah. in Co-op City. But Boris and Kingsbridge has been my, been my home. When I was like 20, like 18 to 20, there was this Colombian kid came straight from Columbia. His name was Jeffrey Monge. Uh, shout out to Jeffrey if you're out there, brother. He moved to LA, but in the time, he was like the nastiest guitar player of my age who I ever met. Yeah. And I thought, this is it. This is this is it. I, I, we talked about this on the podcast, actually. I went to his crib the day that I met him just because I seen him on the street one day yeah. and he was like straight out of the 80s. He had long hair, a <laughs> uh, patched out vest, uh-huh. uh, bullet belt, uh-huh. the chains and shit like that. He was... Which is something to see yeah. in the Bronx. It is something to see in the Bronx. Especially Kingsbridge. If you know East Kingsbridge Road. Yeah, there's not... That, there's you know, not... We don't, Brave we don't do that here. I yeah, rock yeah, the man. vest, but I rock the vest with the fitted and the Jordans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. So it's a little street, a little metal. Yeah, and you, you can know? still see some old timers yeah. like, you know, like Black Spades who rock their oh, exactly. vest and stuff like that. So it's not out of place, but bullet so, belt. But <laughs> rare, rare. So I see this kid, and we start talking in the street. He invites me to his crib. Next thing you know, we're smoking mad pot, listening to space. He's showing me skull fist for the first time. <laughs> and we're playing guitar together, and I'm just like, yo, this kid is nasty. I wanted to pursue someone with him. It never happened. So yeah. that would be just a theme in my life until adulthood when I was finally like, fuck it, I'm old enough now. I played with the Judas Syndrome. We were going to write a new Judas Syndrome record, but then somewhere along the line, me and Nanda looked at each other like, fuck it. You want to just say, fuck being hold to what these guys want to play, which yeah. although we did love it, we we were more on the death metal tip than the metal core tip. Sure, sure, sure. You know, so we, cause especially me and Nando, like we love like Obscura, in Fury, like Alter Beast, fucking like all the Arc Spire, Beyond Creation, all these overtly really technical, technical music yes, bands. Yes. And we wanted to influence that with East Coast beatdown. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And make it more clever and more less niche. Sure. You sure. know, more marketable, if you will. Absolutely. Big nerds like us like that. 
but then you try to market that. So it's yeah, not, like you know. That's you right. want to play the 10 people, sure, by all means. <laughs> uh, and I'll be one of those 10 people. Yeah. I'll be one of those 10 people every time. But, you know, for for getting the most mileage out of your thing, you definitely want to uh, compromise. That's right. That's right. And he's been jamming with Gary lately, and, you know, they're, they're cooking up some things. So nice. Can't really talk. Can't really talk about that. At this time, this time. At this time. Everyone stay but, tuned. Uh, watch out for Sorry. it. Songs in the works. And then, and then nights will, will be a thing. Yes. Yeah, it will. It and will. I also have something that I'm working on that's And he's doing a solo with it. Once ah, I see. Recently, just, just because I realized that I'm in a different place than these guys. These yeah. guys, while they're still active, they've done it already. That's right. Whereas I still have more to do. Yeah. I don't want to be the guy that just writes coattails, even yeah. if I can. I'm not yeah. going to do that. Uh, because I have the prowess, the knowledge, and all the connections to do so. Yeah. So I bought an eight string guitar, right? And I've been working on taking my influences, but also putting some Bronx respect on it. Yeah. You know, yeah, some yeah. of that attitude. I like that. Because cause aside from these guys, I also, like, my friends and shit, they're also just big Bronx dudes. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. My co- my, I call him my cousin. He's my brother from the streets. But Omar, you know, Omar, I grew up with that kid. Um, he was not a hardcore kid by any means. He was, you know, he was a street kid. Yeah, sure. Go, I used to tag with him to, like, go fuck around with girls, uh-huh. to go, like, get into shit with other kids in the street, go through graffiti. Even though I never had a tag name, I used to just tag Slayer logos, <laughs> where where he would have that. His he would uncle, just go do her rat trip, basically. <laughs> basically. Yeah. yeah. But his his uncle is actually a Malali legend. I don't know his Malali name, but I know his name is Louis Perez. Okay. Okay. But he was involved with the original '94. Oh shit. Show and shit like that. So just like all these all these things, elements of my life would just play a role into my perspective on this so to show respect to all of that where i'm from the streets the meme the relationship with these guys all of that is being brought into this new project that i'm doing and it's my anybody i play with everything is probably connects a he's like a malami thing yeah, yeah it does it does yeah. um, organically like that is is there a name for for the your your solo project or you don't want to I don't have let a name that yet. okay you don't have a name yet. okay board. but wow. I have visions in mind and where most death metal people have the illegible shit I want to make it urban in the sense where there will be that but there will also be that groove and maybe have like an old style like graffiti down logo uh-huh, uh-huh. and shit like that well, like it, it's like when 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 we did a different interview and we talked about like is there a Bronx sound and, and part of it is just the idea of like mixing these different things, but also it's just rhythms. It, but it's being real, also. Like we're not like we love metal, a lot of metal bands that have like the whole image thing, but we don't have an image thing, and that is its own image. That's true, and that that's what you're going for here because it's not you know like some of these tech deck bands will will have a certain look to them or whatever. But like, it sounds like you're trying to mix that with kind of hardcore, but not necessarily in in the musical sense. So that, that may be part yeah, of it too, just from, from what little I've heard. But it's also just the idea of mixing that 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 realness with it, like like trying to keep it more street and not how can I put it? Like 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 a lot of the tech that stuff. They, they draw more of the nerdy crowd. Yeah. yeah. The music nerds, which no criticism for me because, you know, I see them when I go to Dream Theater shows. <laughs> but uh, but you're also trying to get a different type of crowd, the type of crowd that's a little more urban, more into, like, street shit. Yeah. I like, like to use... Like what we've done over the years because we're not, you, you know, like, people classify, like, Billy Club and I... Because Billy Club and I read there's definitely like more of like an urban element. Yeah. We're not uh and that and that I guess is the thing that makes us stand out also from the other guys, you know, from our peers, from Sworn Enemy, from EGH. Like those guys do their thing and we all do our thing, but like Billy Club and I rate we got a little bit of the Bronx thing. I would throw also influence on me from the Bronx thing would be District Nine too, because yes. of the yes. content. Yes. A lot. The first time he ever showed me School of Hard Knocks, like, 
I felt that in my soul yeah, because yeah, yeah. I'm living in Morris Ave as he's saying right. I read episode Mordor and the shit he's talking about, like I'm seeing that. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, like that's part of red tape. That's real shit. I've that's part sure. of what I'm talking about because the lyrical content also is not like we love a lot of metal stuff and a lot of other stuff, and some of it's just more like fantasy. fantasy and, that's right. But with the lyric stuff, like especially with District Nine, it's like it's true. Yes, District Nine is the most hood band of all hood bands. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's a hundred percent authentic. Yeah, I, I love that they perform like Mike and Caesar, like they got do rags. Yeah, like that's Bronx shit. Yep, you know with fucking fitteds and all that. Like that, that's Bronx shit. Maybe hardcore has adopted that, but that comes from somewhere, and yeah. that somewhere is the streets. Yep, right. You know, that's Bronx, right. Harlem, Brooklyn, that's right. Queens, etc. Like. You know? That's Cause, right. Because with Billy Club and Irene, it was never a conscious thing. It wasn't like, well, let's lean into that. It's just more like that corporate shit. Like, like the label says that we should wear fittings more. Or like, wear Timberlands. Like, yeah, we just being no, yourselves. We, exactly. we were just doing our thing. And it just so happens that because we're from the Bronx, that's our thing. Like, I, I never thought about, like, well, maybe I should wear these other clothes. Cause, other bands are wearing those type of clothes. And you know, so that's not what we did. District 9 and Fahrenheit were before us. Right. And they led the way. Yes. Right? So, to have them, like, I talk to Mike all the time, District 9. Yeah. To have them have that same respect for us that we had going into them. Right. Is a beautiful thing, man. It, beautiful it, thing. it makes my heart flutter because, not that I wanted to be them, but I really enjoyed what they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really, I was all about it. It, it, it resonated with me because I'm a, I'm a kid from this who lived a couple of blocks from Mike. Yeah. We knew the same people. I met Mike at a Billy Club show. We yeah. probably yeah. fought I, the I, same people. Like, like, I was, I was going to say also the thing with, with us and with those bands too is that we knew, we knew each other and not just. Through music, mm -hmm. like through the book. I, mm -hmm. I first you you met those guys that way. Yeah. I first met back when without a cause was the thing. I first met them through like other connections, not music. My mom and, and, and my cousin Frank grew up in my aunt's block. Right, uh -huh. Elliot. What's that? Uh -huh. Elliot. Yeah. Yep. Yes. They probably knew That's each right. Other. And Kevin was there for a little bit too. They yeah. stole his bike. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Knowing our, knowing our cousin, yeah. uh, if there was trouble to be had at that time in that neighborhood, yeah. they probably were in it together at some point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so, so, Jay, you, men you mentioned your first hardcore show was at a Bronx Beach Club. Um, and I don't remember if it was on camera or off camera. You mentioned Alfie's Place. I think it both. Um, talk about some other, like, Bronx shows that you that you've been to over the years. Well, by the time I was coming up, they were mostly all gone. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah, only yeah, other yeah. place to really add to that list is FLC. Oh, FLC you for know, sure, for um, sure. Taking the four to one twenty five, and taking the six to fucking Pelham Bay, and uh -huh. the bus, uh, to go. You know, it was a pain in the ass to get out there. Absolutely, but it was such a dope spot. You know, like the Bronx is big. It is in a church of all places. Yep. You know. Yeah. And, to see like certain bands there, like after this, or like you know, uh, the Judas Syndrome, or uh, meet certain people that are in the game now that are huge, like Tommy, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Just like having all got their start there, just like the influence. I mostly met more Bronx people, yeah, at shows in like Queens or sure, well, sure. The Bronx never had a lot of venues, huh? yeah, we mm -hmm. talked about that. Oh, like, oh, they yeah. would, and they wouldn't yeah. last very long. That's right. They wouldn't last very long, and by the time you were in the game, there, there, was, was, there was hardly anything left. Was it? I think the pyramid was the Bronx, right? No, no, no. The pyramid was down. Down. There, there was that, one place yeah. that you guys did Project Mayhem. Wasn't that the Bronx? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no. Yes. When well, we did Project Mayhem, it was, it was that downtown. was downtown, right? I see we that. Did, well, we did it at the pyramid. Well, both shows were at the pyramid. Dude. Both shows were at the pyramid. I, I'm thinking of the other Milton show that we had originally did at that other place, Nikki and Sam's. Yeah. Uh, or but that wasn't Roger Man. Yeah. Because. Uh, did, didn't y'all do one of I'm the Milton shows out on Pelham Park, Pelham it, Parkway? Wasn't that one of them? That was, oh, that's that a, was a Billy Club show. show. Yeah, that was a Billy Club show. Oh, you know what? Sorry to cut you off. There was one instance in which Magoo's. No oh, way. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, because it's in a. Uh, it's in a. Uh, Scotty or. One of the Hellbound guys, I think, 
I remember I, I somehow associated with Ms. Right. with Magoo's. I don't remember how, but well, well, I used to live down the street from yeah. Magoo's. At one uh, time recently, yeah. one of his ex bandmates, Tommy Vinton, Tommy Vinton, uh, who was in a band called Jinx and another band called Newcomer, he did a show with Jinx at that club, yeah. right, right yeah, on Broadway, yeah. right on Broadway, uh, yeah, at the bar, and that was like one of the only times in recent memories in which there was some at the Bronx. I don't know why they didn't do more after that. that <laughs> well, Magoo's is gone now. Yeah, Magoo's yeah, is Magoo's closed now, now. R.I.P. But yeah. most of those other venues, like the Depot and stuff like oh, that, yeah, they used to get drunk there. Yeah, Depot was long gone. Yeah, those, I, I guess Alfie's place is probably the most recent. That was yeah, a few yeah, years ago. Yeah, it was at Alfie's, but that place is closed now. Yep, R.I.P. One more thing I want to mention about the relationship between Billy Bob and Ivory. Um, when I read Profile, I was, and before Judas Syndrome, actually this pairing led to Judas Syndrome. Uh, Gary and I, and Nando, and Yubi, Irene, and Chris, who was in Judas Syndrome with me, and also an athletist, right. we had a cover band called Project Mayhem. And we played two shows at the Pyramid. Two shows. Uh, a year apart, both, both yeah. times. Yeah, well, they were both... Oh, for the same we, cause. We did Milton Moran. Yeah, uh, Milton from Golden Mentis yeah. got killed. Yep. We did a few for a few years. We did a tribute show for him that helped raise money for his family. Yeah. So the first, I think the first one or two we did. I think we did four altogether. The first one was at Nikki and Sam's. The second one. Was Knitting Factory? No, the first one was the Knitting Factory. The second one, I think, was Nikki and Sam. And then the last. And then the pyramid. other two were at the Pyramid. Mm -hmm. I see. Because that was when we had the connection, where they, they were booking shows at the Pyramid regularly, and uh, and we did that for the last two years. And it was a cover band that we did. Uh, it was an idea that actually somebody else gave me when I was in Puerto Rico. Uh, or no, I'm thinking of something else. But uh, I forget why we came about. I forget. I, I forget how came. how the story came together. But we were like, you know what? Let's just do a cover thing because because we're all tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil and Chris were doing the Judas Syndrome at that point. Actually, no, it no? was right before. Really? Yeah. That okay. kind of inspired us to work more together. And oh, I thought I thought it was, uh, I, I thought it was, was right after off at that point. But either way. Uh, I had known Chris from Athletes anyway, and the other irate guys, so we were like, hey, let's do this, and we ended up doing covers of metal songs. What did we do? Like what kind of I, we, we did Sample Tour, we okay. did Metallica, we did Megadeth, All we right. did Slayer, we did Anthrax, and Pantera. Right. Machine Head. And Machine Head. Okay. Yeah. We, I think we only did like four songs each time or something. Like five each time. Four or five. Yeah. But but we did it was all covers and we worked it out and, and that was fun it was, man it was I fun bet. it was crazy I bet that was super fun yeah, and, was and then people were bugging out yeah, yeah we did because death song. We did oh you did a death song what death song we did philosopher oh philosopher. that's yes, a, I that's love that song we did a philosopher we nailed that that was, was good. fantastic it was wow like, Phil pointed at the wrong person for yeah. the solo <laughs> uh, <laughs> totally botched that yeah because it was a bass solo which. It was weird for me anyway, but then... Yeah, I'm, I'm like highlighting the solos, yeah. and I point to the rock. <laughs> I mean, I point to the Nando, but it was my solo. Was like, Oops. Yeah. Oops. Like, yeah. <laughs> Too much weed. But, uh, you know what's funny? He has a history of doing that, because the only show we ever played together, he kicked my fucking head off. My oh, yeah. <laughs> and Gary's my roadie at the time, and he's like trying to... He don't got yeah, I've, I ran up on stage. Oh, and my God. Like, Fuck, I can't figure it out. and just pulled it out. And, yeah. And just let it rock. But, wow. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Run run. Well, the other thing too is that since since we all got along so well and the chemistry was the way it was, like we got to fuck around with those songs a little bit. Yeah. Like Tornado of Souls by Megadeth. Do you remember that they worked out like they harmonized the solos? Yeah, I and I remember the first time they did that in practice, and I was just like and they harmonized. Oh. They harmonized. What is that? Wow. It, it was just insane the stuff that they pulled out. And like we all worked together to pull it out. And, uh, and that would be something I would love to do with them. 
I would love we to talk about again. it over We have years. talked about it, um, and I'm open to it. Uh, but it was a really fun time and a really bonding moment for us. We were already close, but nothing brings you even closer than bonding over creating stuff. Not creating, but recreating. Recreating, yeah, yeah sure. And because uh, we so took fun. the time, because yeah. just like we said before, we like, won't embarrass ourselves. We're not. We we're took not the time to really learn the song. And it wasn't even about like people spending money. It's just the way that we all are. This is part of why we get along. The way we do is that we're we're perfectionists and we want to go out there and put the best thing out possible. Yes. I didn't go um, to those shows, but I did go to the rehearsals. Uh, so I saw like the behind the scenes. Yeah. And fun, interesting tidbit of history. During those rehearsals, Chris would show up and start showing them what would be TJS songs. Uh, so, like at the time, he was showing them underneath Blood Skies. It's like, hey, I got this riff. This is kind of how it goes. So, like, I saw that. That was a theme in my life: is watching a lot of things unfold. Yeah. In real time. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying yeah. about you being a sponge because yeah. just just by being around this stuff, right? And seeing it all. And you you had already started down that path. When you were starting to play guitar. You were interested yeah. in music, listening to fucking Dying Fetus and Four. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's just from that, like I had that in a different way with my older brother because my older brother was in cover bands and I would hear the stories. Like I never got to see him perform. Oh, Mike? Yeah. Because uh, he was in bands doing like Juice Priest and Van Halen and stuff like that. And I would hear recordings. I never got to see him perform, and it was like he was sitting around because he was a singer and a drummer. So it's not like in our fourth floor apartment he's got a fucking drum set set up or anything. So I I never got to see him perform, but I always heard him and you know there were some some people in his wife's family, and that's how he met his wife that were band people. So I would hear them telling stories about Richie Blackmore and shit like that. And that was kind of what I absorbed. Like, I just heard those stories and it made me interested in wanting to play. So it's kind of the same thing for you, but on steroids, because you were just surrounded by people and you're hearing them play and, and you're hearing the stories and just absorbing, like, the work ethic. Also. And some of my crazy friends. You mentioned I had a drum set in the fourth floor apartment. My best friend Edward had a full fucking drum set on their first floor Bronx apartment in 197 <laughs> University. Wow. Right. Uh, we used to have jam sessions. We played Metallica, yep. Anthrax. Well, listen, wow. metal songs. And to, to Connor Bell, uh, you saw and, 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 right. and credit to his mom, credit to his mom, Maida, right? Dominican woman had no love for that music at all. Fucking hate it. <laughs> you know? Never once did she complain. She wow. would have to us. To him, absolutely. She loved the evidence. But uh, in the hood, you yeah. can get away with that sometimes. In the hood, you can. Yep. Well, because when I was playing, when in I was in New Jersey, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. No, well, listen, you know, White Plains Road, Mars Park, you couldn't do that either. But if you were over like near the concourse, when with Tito and what eventually became Driven by Hatred, we were in Don the drummer's like second floor apartment uh -huh. jam. That's and, right. And I always thought to myself, like, how are we even going to shit? I rate in Riverdale, bro. Yeah, it's crazy. That's another thing. Riverdale, I'm surprised that flew in Riverdale. I know, me too. Hey, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, that's another thing I forgot to mention. As a child, I've been to that UV's house in Riverdale. Ah, uh, okay. Said, I've hung out with them and the Metro North tracks as yeah. a four-year-old <laughs> and shit like that. That's, that's really how I met those guys. I remember being four years old playing with rocks in the train tracks and shit like that by the water. And, like, just thinking it's wow. normal, but, like, just so iconic. Your man. normal step would think I'm the worst follower. I'm <laughs> the best follower. <laughs> uh, he never got censored, man. I was showing him the worst horror movies. I was going to say, when it comes to the movies, I know I'm saying. Because yeah, that's why I was raised. Don't you play Grand Theft Auto really? Yeah. You know, you know what's fucking funny? That was the thing he didn't want me to do was fucking play Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. Really? Right? Yeah. No, no, I remember this. That was a lie. I used to have to sneak, oh, no, Chris, uh, maybe your mother gave me crazy. I used to have to sneak around and go play it at people's houses. So, like, he, no, my mother was definitely probably the one who influenced him on Grand Theft Auto. However, to his own fruition, he didn't want me to play Devil May Cry. 
And which, because it was. I don't remember. No, I remember it because I was like, what the fuck you mean you don't want to play that shit? Look what you're into. You're going to, you know, you call the, uh, the kettle black a little bit here. So, uh, oh, hold on. Definitely cries cry is a problem with dying fetus and four. <laughs> That's why I was like, yeah, I don't know. Welcome to my life. It must have been his mother in my ear. Something's wrong. Or my grandmother. Because, yeah, sure, uh, sure, sure. All the grandmothers. Yep. Because my grandmother definitely, definitely, well. She was used to it. You were watching titties while you were watching. She was used to it. While she was used to it, to say that she wanted that path to continue, maybe not. Maybe not, right? But uh, <laughs> grandma's guilty too, because grandma let me rock. Right. <laughs> Definitely in the neighborhood, grandma. But you know, whether she liked it or not, it's a different story. Uh, now, um, Jay, a couple things that. You know, a, a lot of other people have talked about in their oral history, which I'm interested to hear you and the next generation um, to talk a little bit more about, like, the stores you go to for instruments, the stores you go to, like, for, you know, CDs or, you know, records, whatever. Um, would they be in the Bronx? Would they be in Manhattan? Talk a little bit about that. Okay. Well, mostly in Manhattan. Yeah, sure. sure. Because that's what was around. However... I did used to go to, like everybody else, to Rogan's Music. Okay, okay. On yeah, Webster. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's the deal. My experiences at Rogan's was vastly different <laughs> from these guys' experiences at Rogan's. At the time, I would go there. They would, the old man was there. Mm-hmm. But, like, no Frank, no yeah. Joe Red Page, no Loki, no Loki, uh-huh. none of that. So, like, I was not met with the same embrace at Rogan's yes, yes, as yes. these guys were. If anything, when I would go there with my friends... The old man would probably want us to hurry up and get the fuck out of there. Um, because I would go and like, I I've, bought, I've bought shit there. Like, you know, I bought my first head there with yeah, the sure. Ibanez Tone Blaster 150 watt head, which sounded like shit, but to me it sounded like cool in the moment. Um, one of my Ibanez RGAs, um, I had played there first and then asked my parents for it for Christmas. Uh, I remember one time I went, like, I was dating some girl and I went down there to sell a bunch of shit. And, like, I had made her help me carry it down there. Because it was just so much, and to her credit, she did. <laughs> um, and and so, but you know, I spent a lot of time in there. Um, I, I have gone. This is not metal, but this is culture related. Sure. One of the spots that I like to go to, even today, I went there like a couple years ago. Uh, but that comic shop on For- uh, Fordham and Webster with Chinese Phil. Yep. Chinese oh, yeah. Phil, baby. Chinese Phil still there. Hold I it can't down. believe that because he yeah. was there when I was a teenager. That's crazy. And That's he, crazy. he's not afraid to, to give you stuff. Like, he'll be like, oh, what you like? Oh, try this, try this. You want this? I got this, I got this, I got this. Yeah. That man knows how to hustle in the same some <laughs> I went down there with the intention to spend like 10 bucks. Right? Right? I spent like 100. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's good at yeah. that. But there was also a store that we went to that I'll never forget this. I think it was one of those Chinese gift shops. I could be wrong about that. It was a spot at Fordham Road we went to. I was like five or six, and he found two of the original set of Metallica and Justice for All figures. Uh, so we went to Fordham Road one day, and I remember walking toward like the con- it was somewhere off the concourse. I remember yeah. seeing the D train, and rec- I'm a little kid at this point, so I'm recognizing the D train as hey, we can take that home. Yeah. Right. So. Somewhere near there, we went to some store where he goes, and he's shocked, just as I am, to find Lars Ulrich and Jason Newstead at a fucking store in Fordham Road, of all places. In the wow. Place. So there was that experience, but mostly when it came to shit, I used to go a lot to like St. Mark's or like Virgin Records. Sure, you know, sure, definitely sure. Virgin Records, because like I used to buy video games there. Well, yeah. I didn't buy it. He bought it. Yeah. Uh, he bought me. <laughs> Like video games there, toys, CDs, movies. It was such a big place. Like they had so much shit there. Yep. But then also like Generation Records, I would go on my own to buy like shirts. Sure. Or like the CDs or LPs that they may have or like the occasional signing that they would do, shit like that. Um, we were, where, where we would go also, this isn't music related, but like this is just part of us hanging out. When I was little, we went to go see Rob Van Dam and Booker T at a signing in Manhattan. And I remember the line was like outside down the block around the corner. He wasn't having that. He wasn't having that. He was like, fuck this. We're going to go with that. So we went in there on the guys that were shopping. But really, we were stalking the table. <laughs> and, and every instance he could, he would lift me up. And there was this one guy who was security there. He was eight the whole time. 
He kept trying to be like, yo, you can't do that, blah, blah. He's like, what? I'm just holding him, you know, like, I'm like, holding my son. I'm like, I'm looking at CDs and shit. What the fuck are you talking about? Get in my face. And, uh, that was actually Motel's next to the AMC Theater on 42nd. It's not there anymore. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay. But it was that Motel's there, and they had, that, yeah, Rob Van Damme and Booker T. Wow. So there was that. There were several shops in St. Mark's. That I used to, when I was a kid, I used to like to wear the spike bracelets and the chains. Yep. They had plenty yep. of that at St. Mark's. Yep. There were comic book shops that had like metal horror figures. Sure. And shit. There was one in particular that you had to go oh, down yeah. a couple steps yeah, yeah. where you bought the porcelain. St. Mark's Comics. Right, right. That's where Mark's you Comics, bought the yeah. porcelain legend. That's not there anymore. Right? No. no. It's, it's all Asian exactly. eatery now, right? It was down there, and then at one point, I think it may have been up the steps, like they moved a couple of doors down. But now it's gone. Um, all right, Jay, so uh, it's a question that uh, always comes up at the end of these oral histories. Um, uh, do you think there's a Bronx heavy sound or Bronx metal sound, Bronx hardcore sound, however you want to describe it? And if you think there is, um, what is it? Maybe it's not a sound. Maybe it's something else. Well, not to sound cocky or like a dick, but I think that we are the keepers of that sound. So the same <laughs> thing about our radio. Whether it be, our radio, whether it be Billy Club, whether it be District 9 or Fahrenheit or whatever, it's what we make it because, yeah. you know, we are the founders of that shit. Um, not only that, but it's got to be arrogant. It's got to be mean. It's got to be a little rude and nasty because that's how Bronx motherfuckers are. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're gonna be on that shit, you gotta do it right. Mm -hmm. Bronx all day, brutality. They both start with B. So uh, that's, that's. And by the way, those four that you mentioned are all very different in their own way. Yes, sir. But and yet they still fit there's that the street problem. element that kind of ties them all together. And it's organic. It ain't. It ain't no. Oh, I'm about that Bronx life, but then you know you never hung out in the street and did graffiti or fought some kid in the park or you know some shit like that. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Or, or or even, you know, maybe not sold the drug, but maybe passed one to somebody. <laughs> or uh, uh, smoked the blunt on the fire escape or on the block and shit like that. Drugs, man. Fuck you up, bro. <laughs> been thrown on the wall and been stopped and frisked by the cops and shit like sure, that. If sure. you never hung out on a roof. Yeah. Exactly. Or, or you know, some might say had, you know, uh, a situation with a female on the roof. Guilty. <laughs> or in a staircase. Or yeah, shit like that. If you never yeah. ran for the cops. <laughs> that too. Yep. Or, or from other people. Sure. You sure. know what I'm saying? All these things put into the music, that's what makes it Bronx sound. Yeah. In my opinion. Whether it's death metal, hardcore, metal like Demolition Hammer, uh -huh. it doesn't matter. Because even those thrash dudes, Demolition Hammer, they're street motherfuckers at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to Steve Burns, and you'll hear the street come out. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to say about that. And I got to say that I love all these guys Billy Club Sandwich, I Ray, everybody. Everybody, athletes, uh, through the discipline, dehumanized, sworn enemy. Oh, I love you all. Thank you for being monumental in my life. And I want nothing more than to make you all proud of me for it. Awesome. Nice. Thank you, Jay. All right. Phil Motley, closing thoughts. Anything else you want to add? Uh, it's an honor to sit here with my son and one of my best friends in the whole world and talk to you guys about our history and the relationship between the two bands and all the wonderful things we've done together. But now it's his time. And so I gladly pass the torch to him. And I know he's going to do us proud uh, because he, uh, he's, he comes from me. And we, we, we vibes, we win. We, we don't lose. So that's what I have to say. But thank you to everyone who has ever listened to Irate ever moshed, ever had sex to us, ever, you know, went to jail, whatever, whatever it is. Um, thank you, um, because without you, I'm not sitting in this table with my son all these years later, uh, reliving some amazing times. So shout out to everybody, shout out to my family, my wife, my boy, and all my friends. And shout out to my mother and my brother yes, also. Sir. Yes, sir. You know, I can shout a million people out, I'm gonna shout those two out. We love you, Joey. Basically. And I said it before, and I'll say it again, like for us, this is our legacy and this is what, this is our life's work. So for us to be able to pass on some of that knowledge to the next generation is key. And I couldn't ask for better than that. And that, you know, that's a gift that we give to you because we work 
hard for all this shit. And like I said, we made a lot of mistakes, and that's how we learned how to do the things that we do. And you can learn from us, and, and we're happy with that. And, and thank you to everybody that supported us, that supported our family, Billy Club, Irate, PGH, Sworn Enemy, all the other bands that we mentioned, because all of them in one way or another are all family to us. Absolutely. And we we got love for every one of them and for every one of you that has always supported us and what we do. All right. Thank you all.